out. We can we can all. We have still two more minutes. Uh, officially, we start at nine, five past nine. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Janja Dajsorin, Program Director of the uh, NGD Software Technology Program. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the Expo Symposium of 2022. In the morning, we will have the uh, set of eight speakers representing the 2022 generation. And in the afternoon, we will have the graduation uh, ceremony. So hereby, I'm going to welcome you to the opening speech uh, by Professor Dr. Mark Mannenbrandt, who is the scientific director of the NGD Software Technology Program and also the graduate school director of the Math and Computer Science uh, Department. So, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Janja. Welcome, everybody, to this, uh, actually, NGD Software Technology XPO Symposium, because uh, PDN is no longer the title that we are using, but we are using the title NGD since the 1st of September. Let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm Mark van der Brandt. I'm a, a full professor of software engineering and technology within this department and already for quite a number of years also scientific director of this, uh, in my opinion, very uh, great program. Um, and uh, for me today is the honor to actually... Oh, uh, somehow... This does not work. I'm a Mac user and not an Apple user of an... Uh no. It's, it doesn't go into full screen mode. I think what I do is... Yeah, we we'll start again. Oh, this one? Yeah. Okay, and the NGD program is a two years program that uh, students can do after their master's program, so typically a post-master's program as a technical university, uh, we offer two different uh, tracks. One is the PhD track, where students are working for four years on and doing research and eventually write a PhD thesis. Or the, the NGD track, which is two years. Uh, in these two years, um, students get, in our program at least, uh, roughly 14 months of training, courses, and industrial in-house projects. So then a group of trainees work on a problem provided by a company. And after these 14 months, they move on to the 10 months design project, which is also the graduation project. 
and that in many cases, actually almost always with a company where the trainee shows that she or he is capable of uh, doing a thorough design, uh, creating a prototype, developing a methodology. So it depends a bit on what kind of project that they are working on, but in the end they have to prove that they are a qualified designer. And if they do that, then eventually they will get the engineering doctorate degree, and that's what we are celebrating today. What is the NG Software Technology Program all about? Um, of course, as it is said in the title, it's about software technology. So, how to create, let's say, advanced and complicated uh, software systems? And the aspects that we address there are not only from a software side, because as you probably will recognize that a lot of software is embedded into systems. Either think of the uh, ASML machines, or think of the Canon printers, or think of the conveyor belts of van der Lande. There's always a system. And it is important that our trainees actually get aware of the fact there's a system aspect. So, Software architecture or system architecture is an important ingredient in our program. And next to that, of course, once you have understood the architecture, is to see how you can come up with a good software design to improve the system or to make sure that the right functionality is provided by the system. And we are not working, let's say, with trivial systems. It's typically software systems or systems which contain a lot of software, which are very software intensive and which range over a broad application domain. So I already mentioned three or four different high-tech industries work, uh, that, that are here in the region. But the, the systems of Philips Healthcare or of a uh, bank like uh, Rabobank uh, are also very complicated systems, but from different applications domain. But we have, given the, the positioning of our university in the high-tech region, of course, excellent contacts with the high-tech industry, and a lot of the projects are done there. So, some figures. So, up to now, we have 518 graduates, including the uh, cohort of 2020. And at this moment, 38 trainees are active in our program, including the cohort of 2022. So who's going to start at the, end of, at the beginning of um, November? What we try to do in our program is bridge the gap of theoretical knowledge to practical applications. So in the projects that in the end projects, there's always a university supervisor involved that brings in the more theoretical knowledge to make sure that there is a good transfer of this theoretical knowledge into the applications. I would like to point out that uh, Raja Sadigi uh, has won in 22 the Software Technology Award and we are very proud on that. And her thesis was on the feasibility and prototype of replacing commercial off the sales pattern recognition solution, was conducted at ASML, and was also nominated for the PDN Thesis Award for 2022. So congratulations, Raja, uh, and also to the supervisors, Odyssey and Sifeng. This is, these are the pictures of the current generation, or the generation that will receive today um, their uh, diploma. A few of them uh, have dropped out of the, the program and a few have, uh, are delayed. And I would like to say a few words on this. I think that this generation is a very exceptional generation. 
They started in COVID. They had a lot of online education. They had a lot of projects that they had to do from home. And this, this somehow characterizes this generation. And I'm very glad that although there was a lot of uh, hardship due to, to COVID, that they actually managed to reach this, um, yeah, this point, that they managed to defend their thesis in a good way and um, got uh, good grades. And it's not only, let's say, the situation that they had due to COVID, but also for a few of them, home situations. Um, we can think of all the things that are currently going on in the world, what happens in, in Ukraine, what happens in Iran, what happens in Pakistan. There are always worries about how are things going at home. And also this generation had these problems. So, as I said, I'm very proud that all of you are here today and managed to reach this final goal. So, we had 15 trainees and three are delayed in the graduation, coming from 10 nationalities and 30% of our trainees um, are female. Before I hand over the floor to Janja again, so what, are, what did we do for the in-house training projects for this generation? So we had a few projects on software and AI with Onera Health and the European Space Agency. Both were great projects and also resulted in nice results. And we had also um, four multidisciplinary projects where not only our trainees were involved in, but also the trainees from uh, ASD and MSD. And the multidisciplinary projects this year for this generation were a project with Duff Trucks, Fruit Masters, Siemens and Airbus. And we are also for very um, thankful that these companies actually came up with the projects and allowed both, gen both the ASD, MSD trainees as well as the software trainees to work on the projects. I would like to conclude here. Unfortunately, I cannot attend the whole uh, uh, symposium, uh, but I will be back this afternoon in the ceremony where we hand over the diplomas. So enjoy the symposium. Enjoy the speakers, and I give the floor back to Janja. Thank you, Thank you Mark van den Brandt. So, we're well on time. So, before we go to the next uh, speaker, actually the first speaker of the Expo Symposium, Chopin Rafal, are there any questions? For Mark, usually there are no questions. So we will kick off the Expo Symposium of 2022 with the speech of uh, Shapam, uh, Shopam Raval, who has done his research, uh, actually a final project at uh, Philips Research, on the topic of uh, automatically uh, transforming uh, templates. Um, actually, what kind of template? It's not usual templates. You are going to find out to uh, healthcare compatible models. The title sounds like very easy, but this project has been highly valued by Philips. Last week on Friday, Chopin also has presented his results to the uh, whole set of architects and designers of the healthcare, Philips Healthcare and also research, and it was successfully received and highly valued. So here, the floor is yours, Chopin. Uh, do you have the thing for this? Yeah. Uh, it's not working. Oh, this works, but um, yeah. uh, the, the laser actually works.
Okay, uh, thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to present my project uh, that was done in collaboration with Philips and the Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, the title is quite a mouthful, but basically we're taking some templates from a radiology system and converting them into fire models, a new framework. I'll give you a brief introduction of the problem, uh, and then I'll focus on my specific project. I'll talk a little bit about the methodology, and uh, then I'll tell you how we verify and validate the models that we generate. Right, uh, let's jump straight into the topic. So this picture gives you an overview of the radiology workflow. So it might start with a patient going into a physician's office, who might then recommend them for, a, uh, for an imaging study. So the imaging study is taken in step two, and all this data is then sent to the radiologist, who then has to interpret the data, create a report on it, and then communicate it back to the radiologist and the patient, uh, the physician and the patient. Then we can start this process of shared decision making and treatment if necessary. As you already notice here, the information systems that are used in different circumstances are different. So a physician might use what is called an electronic medical record, or EMR, uh, to uh, record the patient data and create study orders. The radiologist, on the other hand, might use a picture archiving and communication system, or PACS, to record the imaging data. Unsurprisingly, there have been major advancements in the last few decades in, in information systems that are used in medicine. So I already mentioned PACS and EMR. There are clinical dashboards that collate all this information together and give better clinical context. Uh, we also have uh, diagnostic AIs that are uh, used to give some pre-diagnosis information to the medical professionals who can then review the information. And no doubt, there is a large amount of this clinical data. Uh, as a primer, what you saw in the first slide, the, not only the systems, but also the standards that are being used in, in these different systems are, are different. So an EMR might send a uh, study order in the form of, an, uh, of a Health Level 7 version 2 message to a PUX. Uh, the modality, on the other hand, which could be a CT, a CT machine or an MR machine, sends the imaging data in the form of DICOM, which is another standard. And these two standards are usually very, uh, not very interoperable. So in this scenario, the uh, radiologist now either operates an EMR to get the physician information, study information, or sometimes the PACS might copy over that information to the, to the PACS itself. If you look at the other end of the clinical uh, life cycle, where the radiologist is creating reports, most of these are captured as uh, free text, or they are unstructured. And they're usually captured using a speech-to-text microphone. Um, unsurprisingly, this information, because it is free text, is not very re reusable. So uh, systems like dashboards and AIs want to use this information, but it is not readily available. Uh, and all these interoperabilities, low possibility of reuse, lead to inefficiencies in the workflow. And this has been linked to burnouts in radiologists, of course. So what's the solution? Moving forward, uh, we want to have structured data. That's really this, the future of reporting. Uh, and not only the data has structure, but it also embeds the clinical meaning within itself. And use of open frameworks that everyone understands, all systems understand, helps with that, but also uh, enabling the information, uh, standard, uh, standard codes within the information helps identify what kind of data it is. Here on the right, you see a logical model of what is called a medical ontology. And essentially, it is a database that captures the medical concepts, gives them a unique identifier, and uh, describes the relationships between the different concepts. There are hundreds of these medical ontologies out there. Uh, so capture of structured data can enable clinical and semantic interoperability, and not only that, it can also enable reuse of this data. Talking about the system of interest, Philips has a PAX called ViewPAX, and it, can, it has all the regular functionality, so you can manage imaging studies. 
but it also provides some uh, features to capture structured data. So you have bookmarks, which are essentially annotations on the image itself, uh, which are, uh, then uh, can be transferred to a report. It also allows for creation of what are called reporting templates. And reporting templates is a checklist for the radiologist. When they want to report, they can create consistent reports every time. But this data is shared as PDF, and it's not publicly available. So how do we capture this data? Uh, you see there's this uh, dichotomy between the different standards. So on one side, you have DICOM, which is quite popular in imaging workflows. And on in, in information-centric workflows, you have standards by health level 7. Uh, reporting data somewhere in the middle, still quite uh, free text. Health Level 7 has a new framework called Fast Inter uh, Interoperability Healthcare Resources, or FIRE, which, uh, we, uh, which is expected to gain widespread momentum and is really seen as a next-generation standard for capturing this information. Uh, it's, of course, based on uh, widely adopted internet standards like REST, object orientation, and it's also free to use, uh, open and free to use. So that's a little bit about the problem domain. Uh, now, my project, I already mentioned these reporting templates. Uh, they're really a nice way to capture consistent and quality reports every time. Viewparks has this nice feature called structured fields, which you can see here. And this allows for specific points of input into the template. So you might give uh, the template some name, you might give some options that might go into that field, and you might also provide a, a code. Uh, and this is a mechanism for capturing structured data. Uh, but the, the, the creation of these templates is very time consuming. It's usually done by hospital staff who are already very busy. Uh, given that Philips has a huge customer base of Viewpacks, uh, Viewpacks and who already have all these reporting templates that they are using, if we can convert those templates into an open format like FHIR, we can really liberate that data for reuse in other applications. And if we find an automated way to do it, or at least part of it, we can lower the threshold for this migration. Right, that leads us to the goals. So we want to convert the, these reporting templates that come from UPAX into FHIR models. Um, and of course, we want to document the whole uh, transformation process. In terms of the non-functional goals, uh, the first one is wide support. And what I mean by that is we want to support varying degrees of templates or, or a large number of templates. But the world of medical reporting is, is quite varied, and every hospital might have a different standard, every country might have a different standard. So we derive a second non-functional requirement, which is extensibility. So we want the tool to be easily extensible uh, so we can support these different use cases. This, the third one is standardization, uh, not only to FHIR, but also by the insertion of these standard codes, uh, we can make the, the models that we generate more standardized. Taking a step back, uh, this is the structure of a radiology report. Again, there are no universally accepted standards on how it should look like. But there are usually information that, that you can normally find, like administrative information, findings, which are the factual observations that a radiologist makes, and of course, the impressions of the radiologist. For this project, we start with the findings. So now I can state my high-level functional requirements, which is we want to convert the findings in a reporting template into the FHIR model. And of course, the second one that's related to standardization, we want to code uh, from standard medical ontologies, these, these concepts that are in the templates. And I already talked about the non-functional ones. So moving on to the methodology, this gives you a high-level transformation of view of what is happening in the tool. We start with a raw template from UPAX. It is encoded, so we have to decode it into a format that can be processed by the tool. The second step is parsing of the templates. Again, there is very, very low clinical structure to these templates, so we have to parse it into an internal representation of what a template should look like, and we call this the ViewPux meta model. 
A meta model is just a model that describes another model, and in our case, the reporting templates. This third step in the process is the semantic interpretation. And this is the place where we input standard codes into the model. For this, we use a tool called the Unified Medical Language System, or UMLS. Uh, it is a metathesaurus that combines multiple ontologies together. So you have a single interface to interact with all these hundreds of ontologies, and that's what we use here. Finally, when we have this enriched model, we perform the generation step uh, in step four. I'll talk a bit more about this, but first let's have a look at the data model that we use for capturing these templates. And to understand that, we first need to talk about FHIR and how it stores this medical information. It uses what are called resources to, to capture the medical information, and these resources are modeled after the domain. So you might have a resource called observation, which uh, stores the findings or a diagnostic report, which, as the name suggests, stores a diagnostic report. For our model, we, use the, we store the template as a questionnaire, and it's really a structured set of questions to solicit information from either a practitioner or a patient. In our case, we use it to gather information about the findings themselves. Now, the findings are uh, observations, like I mentioned, but we're dealing with templates, so we don't define any observations. We define uh, how those observations are created. And we do that using conformance resource uh, called structure definition. Uh, and we capture the options that can be input for a given finding as a value set resource, which defines multiple concepts that can go into that observation. A bit more about the transformation step. Uh, the idea is simple. We have a source model, the templates, which conform to a meta model, in this case, the Viewpux meta model. And we have a target model that we have defined, which again conforms to our fire meta model. Now we can specify these declarative mappings on how to go from the source to the target. So just as an example, you might have something from the input domain, and you know you want to go to a structure definition in the output domain and you can now specify these mappings from the input to output. Of course, you can also have these dependent transformations that are triggered once this transformation is complete. Moving on to the verification and validation. For the verification of the models themselves, we use, of course, unit testing, just like with every software. We also uh, compare new models that we generate to pre-existing models that we have validated. And, uh, we also use industry tools like the Simplifier Validation Tool to check for fire compliance. Uh, for the validation, we want to see how much information from the source model is captured in the target model. And we want to see this in terms of the findings, the constraints that might be present in the source model, or the relationships between different findings. Uh, we also integrate one model with uh, an in-house application uh, just to show the value of, of this uh, fire models that we generate. For the standard codes that we insert, we want to look at the completeness, so how many, co how many concepts can we actually code, and we also look at the accuracy, so how many accurate codes are present in our final model. This we divide into partial and full uh, accuracy, so I'll, go, I'll take an example of this concept called partial rupture. So uh, the full match, as you can imagine, would be a partial rupture. But a lot of these ontologies support uh, a subsumption relationship, so a partial rupture is also a rupture, so that would be a partial match. And this is something we record. For the data set, we get uh, 15 uh, templates from a medical institution, and we also use some sample uh, templates that are provided with Viewpux. Uh, this is just an example, so this is a sample template, and we generate some questionnaire resources, we uh, generate, uh, we code and generate the findings, and so on. For the verification, uh, we use the simplifier validation tool, and everything is, is great, it's, it's rosy. Uh, for the validation, 
for the, the templates that follow standard syntax, so structured fields. Uh, we capture the findings perfectly. For completely free text uh, templates, uh, that is something we do not tackle yet, and that is envisioned as part of future work. For the coding validation results, here are uh, three templates that we validated. They were hand-coded by a, a clinical expert, and uh, we get results anywhere from 65 to, to 90%. Of course, this process is hard, and it requires verification by a clinical expert because of the context of these templates. So as an example, you might have something mentioned in a template, like a radius. And uh, of course, this could be the radius bone or the radius of a lesion. So this clinical context is very important for coding these concepts. Uh, so the, the templates that we use originally are in Dutch. Uh, we translate them into English and do the comparison. Uh, when we look at the Dutch, uh, Dutch transformations or Dutch codings, uh, the results are significantly worse. And that is something that we expect because there are only about 300,000 Dutch templates, uh, Dutch codes, uh, compared to around 16 million in English. To conclude, uh, we did automatic conversion of these reporting templates to, to fire models. And of course, that liberates the data that we already have, and we show the value by integrating with our other applications. Uh, semantic meaning is really important, and uh, we want to add that information to the models to really make them reusable. Uh, but we do recommend uh, transformation to English first, because that really gives the best results. Future work, like I mentioned, more validation with uh, more real-world templates. Um, of course, some, uh, we don't tackle free text templates yet, and that is something uh, we can do in, in, as part of future work, and, and some automations that we can provide as nice-to-haves. For the lessons learned, uh, really the biggest one for me was flexibility. Uh, be flexible. Uh, requirements change quickly. And uh, in this case, they were quite fixed, but the models that uh, you generate uh, aren't going to be perfect the first time, so be flexible, iterate. And the last one is accounting for variability. This is very specific to the medical domain. Um, expect, expect it, account for it, but again, make small steps and, and move towards the future. Thank you, that was my presentation. Thank you, Shopa. So, are there any questions? Uh, we have still five minutes. Okay, Mark. Should it work? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I have actually two questions. Uh, first question is related to the, the tooling that you are using for the model transformation. You yeah. could have expected this question from me, of course. Uh, and the other question, so what kind of tooling are you using there? And the other question is related to the fact that you uh, add semantic information. And do I understand correctly that adding this semantic information is actually making the link to the ontology? Sorry, what was the last part of your last so question? Does it, so adding the semantic information, is this actually the step that you make the link to the uh, used ontologies? Yeah. Uh, so to answer your first question, uh, I use a tool called the .NET Modeling Framework. And the decision was greatly motivated by the fact that I reused some of the code that was already existing. That was in C-sharp. And that's why I used the NMF model transformation language. Um, to answer the second question, yes, we search for standard codes from uh, known ontologies that are already out there, that are popular. And that's the codes we insert. We do sometimes use private codes when uh, codes do not exist at all. So there are millions and millions of concepts. Not all of them are coded. So sometimes we do have to use private codes, but we try to use standard codes as much as possible. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So next one. Our junior trainers always have questions also, so I will just throw it randomly. Yeah. Hi, Shubham. 
Hi. Uh, can you tell a little bit more about the free text reports? Is there also some structure there? Oh, uh, I do not include an example there. Uh, so sometimes you can find reports that have structure, uh, which is clear to, to us as a human. But of course, it might not be structure that is standard used in Mupax. And to tackle those situations, we built extensibility into the tool. So in the future, if we had a parser that recognizes that syntax, we could replace just one component of the whole tool, and then the transformation works as expected. Thank you. I will. I think I will ask the question. So, looking at the process, eh, you make it all so easy. And um, did everything go smoothly? So, looking back uh, as a NGT trainee, yeah, we always reflect and improve. So, what was because you have, of course, listed the biggest uh, lessons learned. But in terms of project management, mm -hmm. what have you learned the most? Uh, to be honest with you, the process went quite smoothly. Uh, that's also because I was part of a team and we usually made plans on what to do. And my advice would be to, to the future trainees uh, who are going into projects now, if you can really align your work with the work that the team is doing, that really gives you the best opportunity to, to A, contribute and B, also make your work a little more valuable. Does that work? Okay. So, but did did you use Scrum or did you also join some uh, meetings, uh, weekly meetings, Scrum meetings? Or so that's what you mean by that? Eh? Yeah. So I was included as part of the team, like I mentioned, and we used a safe process. So we had our team. We also had a value stream that we were part of. We had biweekly meetings and also grooming meetings where we uh, refined our. Uh, process, our requirements, and so on. And I was present in all of them. Uh, so, yeah, that really helped me. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Chopin. So, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. So, our next speaker is uh, Respa Putra. Uh, he has done his project at uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, and the topic of uh, his uh, uh, project is a solution for configuring an on infrastructure as a service. So as you can see, we have picked up as a representative variety of uh, uh, topics, uh, not only software design related. So in this one, you are going to see the challenges that he has tackled in terms of infrastructure for the uh, high-tech company. So floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Anja, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Good morning also for the audience online. My name is Respa, and I'm going to present or tell you a story about my project that I did in Thermo Fisher Scientific, I'm developing a solution for configuring an infrastructure as a service. Let me show you the agenda. So first, you're going to have a short uh, demonstration, oh, sorry, introduction. And then we'll see the context of the project uh, to understand why we're doing this. And I also will elaborate a bit about the uh, problem or the challenges that we solved. And after that, we see how we designed and implemented the solution. I also would like to um, mention briefly about how we evaluate uh, the solution. And finally, we summarize the conclu conclusions and some uh, future works. So this is an individual project, but we also have to involved uh, several teams and also uh, from different departments. I would like to say thank you to my uh, project supervisor and also the team that I'm working with and also the service team for the potential users of, of this tool. So let me introduce you with the Thermo Fisher. Thermo Fisher is an American company. Well, they, it's a leading uh, company in surfing science and product lines, including the scientific instrument, reagent and consumables, and also software services. 
As part of the uh, scientific instrument, Eternal Fisher manufactures several types of uh, high-end electron microscope. They are widely used uh, globally like in the material science, semiconductor, and uh, life science uh, research domain. Take a look at this image. I think everyone is uh, familiar with uh, this image, which is the coronavirus that was identified as, a, as the cause of the pandemic in the past two years. The fact is this image was produced using one of the high-end products from Thermo Fisher Scientific called Cryo-EM. To produce such a high-resolution image, the electron microscope uh, generates more than 3,000 raw images that need to be processed and also uh, rendered into a 3D high-resolution image. They can use or analyze by the scientists in the life science, material science, and uh, semiconductor industry. Therefore, in order to enable this advanced feature of the electron microscope, the Thermo Fisher R&D team built a solution called software delivery platform as an as a infrastructure as a service that is highly configurable based on the uh, customer uh, requirements. So in short, we call it SDP. It contains multiple layers of uh, technologies, including hardware, network, also using uh, VMware uh, as a hypervisor. And it's run multiple uh, operating system. And also using uh, cloud technologies, such as uh, Kubernetes, to provide an environment to host uh, multiple application suites for the, for the customers. So when the customers purchase an electron microscope, including the SDP, it has to be configured by the service engineers from the service organization. At the initial installation, we only have one instance, where we call it a configurator node. And the configurator is built using a CLI-based application. So the code um, was written in the Bash application, and it's uh, infrastructure as code using Ansible technology. There are multiple uh, types of uh, infrastructure as code that you can uh, use, like Terraform, Puppet, and Ansible. In the context of this project, Thermo Fisher uh, uses Ansible technology. So there are two main components that I would like to introduce here. First is the Ansible playbook. It contains a set of instructions that are uh, typically executed manually by the service engineers. So we can store it and group it into, into and store it in a file called Ansible Playbook. Second component is the inventory file, or Ansible inventory. It contains the desired state of the SDP uh, configuration, like how many uh, Kubernetes workers we want to have, what are the IP addresses, MAC addresses, how much memory you want to uh, allocate, and how big is the storage, and some other configuration item. So the inventory file is the main interest of this project because we want to have an easy way to construct the configuration item. So even the lesser experienced engineers could interact with the, with the tool. So just for an overview, in this uh, picture, you can see how many uh, nodes we want to configure. But if, if we expand this, for each node contains multiple lines of uh, configuration item. And if we want to change a certain uh, value, if we open the JSON file, it's easy to change it, but we cannot validate it. You might break the JSON structure instead. And this is also an example uh, that happened in one of the customer side of Tenofisha. So because the current configurator was uh, built using our Bash application, how are they uh, executed? I have an activity diagram here showing the steps of the Bash uh, script execution, but don't try to read everything. I also provide a much simpler diagram that I hope everyone could uh, understand. So when we uh, execute the initial script, 
we will start the installation with uh, installing the prerequisite Linux-based uh, modules, like the SSH, um, Dialog, JQ, Ansible, and some other uh, modules. At certain point, the service engineers will see a uh, dialog asking for more information, like what are the uh, instance name of the node, uh, how many Kubernetes worker you want to have. And also, they can choose template based on the deployment type, like we're configuring for uh, life science, we're configuring for material science. We have a different uh, kind of template for the configuration. Just to give you an example, this is how it looks like for uh, strings and numbers uh, input dialog. This is for the selection box, and this one is for the confirmation box. So you get the idea. And at the end of the process, we will, uh, the Ansible inventory file will be generated and can be used to configure the SDP. So after we talk with the uh, users, also with the developers, we see some challenges that we want to you know, improve the existing uh, configurator. Like, because it's uh, built using CLI-based uh, application, it uh, has a number of uh, challenges, like difficult to navigate because we have a number of uh, steps uh, that we need to follow. Also, we want to have validation mechanism so we can validate the input that the service engineers uh, filled in. And we also want to provide an overview of the current uh, configured infrastructure. So whenever the service engineers want to update a certain uh, configuration, they can inspect the existing configuration first before make any changes. And transparency is also important, so we want to know how many steps we, want to, we need to follow to complete the uh, installation or the deployment. And last but not least, there is some manual works whenever we made mistake. Sometimes the service engineers have to open the uh, file and change the JSON file manual, which is error prone and also very risky, because you might break the structure instead. So the main challenges of my project was uh, we tried to bridge the gap between the highly configurable uh, infrastructure with an easy-to-use tooling that can uh, provide an overview, um, transparency, also could guide the users to uh, deploy the SDP, and can be also used by the lesser experienced engineers. So now we understand the background of this initiative. Let's see how we uh, designed and implemented the solution. So at, at the beginning of the design and implementation phase, we consider several alternatives, like uh, which platform should we uh, develop the solution? Is it desktop-based or web-based or even mobile app, maybe? And what programming language? Also, what framework should we choose? Do we need database, or can we just directly save the data to the file? And some other decisions. And we decided to go with the web-based application using Python with the Flask web framework. And we don't use any uh, database management system because we can directly save the data to the JSON file. And we also don't want to have intermediary uh, component uh, so that need to be maintained as well. So if you see the high level of the architecture of the system, we separated the entry point, the business logic, and also the uh, persistent layer. So the entry point will provide the direct um, services to the users, like the graphical user interface, also handling the uh, HTTP request response, and also generate the uh, HTML form. So we don't have to create the form manually, but we can uh, specify the form and it will be generated uh, automatically. And the business logic handles by the services. We also a separated component based on the um, associated configuration. And it can also establish 
connection to the remote host to acquire some information such as the MAC address of the, of the, of the device, the hardware model, and maybe the, device, uh, the drive ID if you configure uh, a storage. Because the easy to use aspect of the system is also important, we implemented uh, wireframes using Figma or the UI mockup. Figma is widely used in the front end developer uh, community to help them to have an early prototype to the potential users to, so they can interact with the mockups, give us feedback on how uh, an easy to use GUI looks like. And at the end, we'll improve the usability of the system. And in summary, we implemented a system that transformed the Bash or CLI-based application into a web-based application with a graphical user interface and also based on Ansible technology. Let me show you how the application looks like. This is the home page of the system, so now we clearly see how many steps we should follow to install the SDP. We also have the uh, inspect menu so we can have an overview of the existing configurations. You can also update. And we also provide a quick action menu so uh, the users can change a specific uh, configuration based on a specific use case. Just an example of the, of the form. We, in this example, we are in the Kubernetes worker uh, uh, configuration form. We can add, uh, can delete. Is it connected to the microscope network or to the uh, customer networks and some other configurations? At the end of the process, we'll have the overview of the configuration. You can also change it if uh, some of the value are input incorrect. The main feature that was uh, derived from the use cases, so the users can use uh, the system to clean install the SDP, can update the configuration, have uh, an overview of the visualization for the existing configuration, and also support, support several uh, deployment templates. For the testing strategy, also would like to mention briefly about how we evaluate the system. We have four strategies. We did static analysis, unit testing, functional testing, and exploratory testing, because we also want to um, have a manual testing, testing with, the, with, the, with the users, explore the features of the, of the system. But I would like to elaborate a bit on the functional testing, because I think it's uh, interesting to share with you all. So we are using Cypress with Cucumber, so we can have a clear test definitions because it's using um, non-technical language. It also comes with a nice uh, portal so we can inspect how many tests and we can execute the test easily. And it's fully automated. You can also execute it in the headless mode, meaning that it will be useful if we integrate with automation tools like Jenkins or GitLab CI. Uh, also, by having a functional testing, we also cover some of the regression testing because the Cypress actually hit the entry point of the system and also hit the surfaces and also then save the data. This is pretty handy when, when we also want to have a quick demonstration to the, to the stakeholders. Instead of opening the system and filled in the forms because we have, we have multiple uh, steps to follow, we can simply run the test and we can also see the animations, and we can inspect the results uh, afterwards. Um, we also implemented the CI pipeline. So we have a different uh, stages. Like we, first, we build the Docker images. Then we test it. If everything is successful. We publish the Docker image to the uh, Thermo Fisher uh, Docker registry. Otherwise, the system will uh, notify the developers if we have any uh, test failing. 
So by having uh, the Docker images running, we can isolate uh, the test environment. So instead of establishing S uh, SSH connection to the remote host, the system use a Docker container simulator. So we have a vCenter simulator running as a Docker container, so we can use it to mock the uh, communication. So in summary, we achieved that we can uh, we implemented a system that transform uh, a CLI-based application, also including the business logic as well, and provide a nice graphical user interface. It allows multiple templates based on the uh, customer requirements with a graphical user interface that can help the lesser experienced uh, engineers also interact with the system and implement it with continuous integration and automated testing uh, pipeline. For the future works, I think it will be opportune to integrate the SEA with the current SDP uh, release cycle, because the SDP also uh, delivered uh, continuously to the, a new version of SDP continuously delivered to the uh, customers. By integrating the SEA will also help the users to uh, maintain the, co uh, the configuration. Uh, one future work is by adding new features such as uh, monitor the configuration execution will be also uh, useful for the service engineers so that we have, we have one place uh, to configure and also to execute the configuration and see uh, the progress of the execution. If you have any question, feel free to ask. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Respa. So, okay. questions? Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was very good. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, one of them is that where is your application running? Is it in inside the microscope, or is it in your like local machine and it it's make it makes a remote connection to the uh, microscope, uh, microscope? So if I understand your question correctly, mm -hmm. you're asking where is the system running, right? Yeah. Is it in the, inside a microscope or mm -hmm. in some other environment? So yeah, as I showed in the beginning of the presentation, mm -hmm. we have SDP mm -hmm. or the software delivery platform, which is an uh, independent component. Mm -hmm apart from the microscope. So mm -hmm. we have to deploy this system on the SDP. So it's part of the SDP system. Maybe I can show you. Oh, it's uh, a bit long. <laughs> That's okay. okay. So but yeah. I mean, I didn't get it. Is it outside yeah. of microscope? Outside, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and uh, uh, why did you choose Ansible as your tool I mean, for the communication? Yeah. For that question, why we choose Ansible mm -hmm. uh, is out of scope of my project because okay. the current or the existing configurator uh, was using Ansible. Mm -hmm. They also have, uh, uh, how can I say, like in the previous project, they also did this uh, comparison. Mm -hmm. Like, is, is it Terraform or Puppet or Ansible? They have a complete uh, comparison there. If you're interested, I can share yeah. with you why they choose Ansible in this case. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Also, thank you for the presentation. I've got one question relating to the scale of uh, users that are using this. Um, can you give a sense of uh, how many field engineers are confronted with this new UI? Yeah, I can say that. So currently, uh, the region separated in three regions, like in America, European, Middle East, and uh, Africa, and also Asia. So for each region, they have like, if I'm not mistaken, two or three uh, service engineers who interact with the system. So yeah, if I answer your question, how many users will use this? Yeah. OK, so thank you. The service engineers.
So I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you said there were some deployment templates in there. So is it like I can choose one and all of the options are already configured? Is it something like that? Yes. Or do I have to just go through one by one? Yes, exactly. That's uh, why we choose template. Oh, we have templates so the user can choose uh, the template, and all of the form will predefine. So you can you have to go through the step, but the they, field will be chosen. predefined. Yeah. Okay. Based so on the deployment template you choose. Okay. Thank you. The second one is: uh, Is it only online? Like, uh, if there is some like in some cases there is no uh, internet connectivity. Can you use it, or is there any option, like backup option, that you can just plug your USB flash and it works? That's actually a nice question, because in the non-functional uh, requirement, we also consider the, uh, the air gap situation. So in some cases, like in the semiconductor uh, customers, there is no inbound and outbound connection allowed. So the system will run completely in the air gap situation, meaning we don't have any internet connection. But since we have all the module inside the SDP, and also it's using Docker container, we can just run it easily. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Okay. Are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just a quick question about the framework that you used. I, if I recall correctly, you said that you used the uh, Flask. I just want to know the reasoning behind it and if you investigated any other alternatives. Yeah, for the framework, for one language, we did not uh, specify many framework, but we be, uh, choose based on the language. Like, we consider PHP all as well, Python, and some other uh, languages. But we choose, OK, what is the uh, most popular framework? And we also consider the prerequisite of the, of the module, of the framework. Let's say we choose Django for Python. It contains of the you know, predefined modules that we might not need. So, that's why Flask, we think it's more, uh, more lighter here. So. Thank you. Yeah. So while Liana is setting up his slides, um, I think, um, so in your case, uh, you have um, worked on this for 10 months. So of course, I'm trying to ask all the reflective yep. questions. But you have talked about the architectural decisions. And as ease of use was one of the key requirements for the yep. web application, how did you ensure that uh, it was realized? OK. So in the project, uh, we have to involve everyone. Like in this case, because the easy to use of the system is very important. So we in involve the potential users. Even though they are in the separate department, we have to you know, approach them and make an agreement or like, have a regular meeting with them. So they will get informed, and everyone will be on the, on the same page. And also, by using the wireframe using Figma, we can also uh, give the early prototype so they can play with the uh, UI uh, prototype even before we implementing the system. Right? So that's how we try to achieve this goal, the easy to use uh, requirements. Okay, so more iterative approach. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and I think uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you. So, the last speaker for the morning session, uh, right before the coffee at 10.30, is Liang Wan. He has done his um, project at Philips uh, Sustainability. Uh, not many people know about Philips Sustainability Group, uh, so we are very honored to carry out, uh, in fact, a third series, third project with uh, Philips Sustainability. And his project is about, it's actually called From Data to Insights, but actually it's about ensuring how do you transport um, Philips product in an environment friendly way. And so his contribution, in fact, contributes directly to that uh, mission of Philips.
morning, everyone. I am Leon, and today I am going to give you a brief introduction about the project we had between Philips and TUE, from data to insights to drive sustainable, sustainable change in Philips global row free CO2 equivalent emissions. Very long title. So what is the project about? We will start with a brief story. So imagine that you are ordering a Philips toothbrush from the Philips website. So you made a purchase on your phone. Once we receive your order, we will verify that if we have this toothbrush you are asking for is in storage or not. And luckily, we have it in stock. Then we initiate the shipping process. So we pack the toothbrush and ship it from our warehouse to your house by truck, door to door. So that was like the brief description of the process when you make a purchase with Philips. And what is the thing that we want to see from this process? So we want to know that Okay. <laughs> Is it moving now? Okay, yeah. So we want to know that where are the transport emissions. So apparently in the process, in the story I just described, the emission, the transport emission happened in the shipping process here, where we are shipping your toothbrush from our warehouse to your house. We want to know that for all our shipments, what are the impacts that we are making to the, to the globe? And that is conveyed by analyzing, calculating and analyzing the emissions within these shipments. So probably I have to stay on this side. All right, so, um, so now you might have the question like, isn't there also emissions uh, when we are producing goods in the factories? Well, yes, you are absolutely correct. But now we have to first discuss about how the emissions are categorized in uh, following the framework. So the emissions are categorized into three types. First one, the scope one emission, which contains the emissions from the fuel burned in, in the company or in the factories, as well as the emissions from the company vehicle. So like, think of um, you're holding a taxi company. So the emissions generated from the running taxis on the road counts as scope one emission. As for scope two emission, uh, it contains the emissions generated from the company bought electricity, water, heat, or any kind of energies. And lastly, the scope three emission, uh, it basically contains everything else, such as employee commuting, product shipment, that's our case, and also product use. So putting everything together now, the project is actually just about evaluating the CO2 equivalent emissions along our road freight shipments. And the results for this emission can also be used in product emission analysis, supply chain improvements, and even um, pollution reduction estimations. So by analyzing the results, we were uh, expecting that we can dr drive new strategies to deal with the emissions that we generate in our logistics process. So probably we need some improvements in such a process. So this is our final result. This is what we call as a dashboard, the user interface that faces our users who is, will, uh, who is trying to um, view the total emissions and like 
the total uh, shipping distance as well as the expense of all the shipments. So um, this dashboard might seem a little bit overwhelming, like you don't know where to locate your focus at, right? But the most important thing that we want to draw from this dashboard is the emission. Yes, okay, the emission highlighted over here. All right, so among all these elements you saw there, this is the most important element. So how do we evaluate this number? We start with this equation, the ultimate equation for calculating emission. This emission was defined following the Global Logistic Emission Council, or the GLEC framework, and how do we calculate it? So basically, we multiply the chargeable weight. So chargeable weight refers to the weight we have in each, each shipment by the shipping distance in kilometers, and then multiply it by the emission factor. So this is a factor, a number that is used to um, tra transform the results from the previous two numbers into the unit of kilograms in CO2, uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions. And the emission factor was chosen based on the transport mode and the vehicle type. So we have different emission factors for uh, shipments by plane or shipments by boat and shipment by truck or on roads, by vehicle, like, there are also different emission factors uh, among, like, for truck and for van, because the size and the, uh, and the fuel they consume is different. Yeah, this one. Okay. Okay. Right, so like I said, first we multiply the chargeable weights together with the shipping distance, where we obtain a number in the units ton kilometers. And then we multiply the previous results by the chosen emission factor. We obtain a final number we call as total emission in kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions. It's that simple. Weight, distance, factor, then we have the emission. So that was like the most necessary data we need for calculating the emission. And they all come from these three files. The first one, the raw freight data. So this is the raw data that came with, com, came with uh, from our data provider. It not only contains the shipping weights, the chargeable weights, but also some additional shipping information, such as the origin of the shipments, the destination, and the, the cost of the the, the shipment, even like the bill number, the invoice number. And the second one, the distance table. The distance table is a table that we use internally to keep track of the distances between different cities. So uh, imagine that it's like a sheet where we have, hey, origin is from, um, for example, Eindhoven, destination, Amsterdam, and then we have the distance between these two cities. So this is a huge list, it contains about like 400,000 records of various distances between the cities all around the globe. So by using the raw freight data, where we, have to, we can read the origin and destination, we can use these city names, and as well as, together with the country names, as keys to look up this table to evaluate the shipping distance. And then next, the emission factor. It is also a fact. It's, it's also a factor table that uses the key with um, of uh, transfer mode, vehicle type, and also year because emission factors are year specific as key. And then we search our emission factor from this file. So all these files are then loaded into our application and saved a specific, specific format called the QVD format for later use and calculation. 
Apparently, there must be some problems with the raw input data. The data quality couldn't be as perfect as we expected. And here, I'm going to introduce the most two, uh, the two most important or significant defects here, uh, which are the missing chargeable weights and missing shipping distance. By missing chargeable weights, we are referring to uh, shipments that has zero chargeable weight, which is apparently impossible. You don't want to ship anything without a weight. And also, even some, some values that we see are negative, which also is also impossible. And for shipping distance, although we really have a nice table of distances, it's impossible for us to have every combination of between every city around the globe. So there are chances that we couldn't find the distance from our table. And also, there are occasions where we see that the, um, there are typos existing in the raw shipment data. So we wouldn't be able to evaluate the shipping distance. And how do we deal with these problems? I will start with um, evaluating the chargeable weight. Um, OK, there's uh, some kind of misplacement. But uh, OK, so for chargeable weights, we first look at the original weight. If we see that the original weight is valid, which is neither 0 or valid, we, then we accept this value. If it's invalid, for example, if we see 0 value, we take the average weight of the shipments that happened in the same month and same year. So regardless, regardless of their origin and destination, what we care about among this average, uh, uh, the average of this, the, the shipments are the dates here. So if we see that the average of the shipments, the average of the chargeable from the shipments having the same shipping month and year are valid, then we would accept this value as our chargeable weight. But if we're unfortunate that even that is invalid, then we go to a predefined maximum weight. So this value is usually much larger than the usual weight. So like, for example, um, 100 kilograms as a punishment of our emission. Because by setting this number, setting it as a large number, we get a much more increase in our emission. And that is a punishment for having such a bad data quality. So a similar story follows for the shipping distance. If we can find the exact shipping distance, nice, we would accept it. If it's invalid, we go to, again, the average distance. However, this time, besides uh, looking at the shipping dates, we also look at the shipping countries. So we only took those shipments that happen between the same country. In this case, uh, the origin shipment happens between Eindhoven and Paris. So when we are calculating the average, we take only the shipments that happened between Netherlands and France. Take the average distance, shipping distance of all these shipments, and then accept this value as the shipping distance of that specific record. Again, if this is invalid, we get a punishment at a maximum distance, and we get a large increase in our emission. So overall, the principle going from uh, the original weight to average to maximum is taking the numbers from a detailed number to a more general number, small to big. And then after we evaluate these crucial numbers, we have to freeze these numbers to avoid further changes. So whenever we replace the original value, uh, in the shipment data, we have to have them saved to a separate file in case that uh, when we reload the data, it, the emission calculated wouldn't be changed. So now we have the emission ready, and we will link the emission to some additional infos, such as business unit, uh, market region, and even forward the names to provide further analysis. So we can, um, for example, 
uh, analyze among which country do we have the most emission or which business unit is account for the most emission. And then that's our final result. And the result is displayed back to this dashboard. So from the dashboard, you can see that uh, there are um, emissions and the total number of shipments. And there's a map over there. You can see with a type of tall, uh, top 100 routes with the highest impact and site information. So by analyzing this map, we can see that, oh, along which route do we have the most impact to the Earth? Same story for the bar chart in the uh, bottom right corner. So that was the dashboard, and um, it's time to validate our results. We start with validating the functional requirements. So we not only validate if the requirements are good enough, that is, uh, if the requirements are suitable for the project, meets the original requirements, but also validate if we have implemented them correctly. And that was done by uh, validating in our bi-weekly demo session. So in these sessions, we simply just demonstrate what we did uh, on the dashboard to our team and ask for feedback, like, hey, like, do you think this meets our requirements we specified in the beginning? As for the non-functional requirements, they were validated into two, uh, in two steps. First, the user-related non-functional requirements are evaluated by the stakeholder group within Philips. So after we delivered the dashboard, we invited uh, the stakeholders within Philips and then asked them to just play around with the dashboard and, uh, for about a week, and we asked for collect all the feedback to validate if we have met all the non user-related non-functional requirements. As for design-related non-functional requirements, we invite our senior architects and click developer, uh, the, the, uh, and our senior developers to review the process model we designed for this dashboard. And for verification, it's rather simple. So we simply do the, did the verification by verifying if the data was changed during the process because we don't want the numbers, the input, the input numbers are distorted throughout the process. So that was done by validating the number of shipments, uh, verifying the number of shipments, total chargeable weights, and total shipment cost. We verify if they are still the same throughout the process. So, that, so after we achieved a success on the dashboard, we then put our eyes on refining the existing system. And these are the points that we found that can be improved, such as we don't have a, income. We, we don't have a consistent naming convention among different fields. So like, for example, we, have, uh, we refer to emission by um, CO2 equivalent emission, total emission, or emission uh, shipping emission, all these naming conventions, different naming conventions will create confusion for the user. So we have to unify them. And also there are duplicated calculation process since all of the process were just calculating emission. There are chances that we can integrate part of them. And scattered reference data, we have different input data for different mode of transport. We have a separate source for air, for boats, for, for ocean, or for other parcels, so they are all scattered around and it make it hard to integrate and maintain. And also, unfocused dashboard, like you just saw, it's kind of overwhelming. So basically, by applying the latest model we designed, we managed to solve the first three issues. We have uh, the naming convention unified, also we have some crucial steps integrated so to prevent duplicated calculation, and also uh, the data source were integrated as well. However, for the final use of interface, unfortunately, we didn't have time to propose a brand new interface, but we still managed to improve some of the, uh, the charts. So what did the project brought to Philips? So apparently, we came up with a new application that calculates and analyzes the road trade emissions 
within Philips logistics process. And also, we came up with a new emission calculation process model that is single data sources. We integrated the data source. And also, single threaded, duplicated calculation process was removed. And it is highly maintainable since um, the data were integrated and kept in the same storage. And that was it for my presentation. Thank you for paying attention. Thank you, Leon. So, any questions? We have coffee break afterwards? Okay, here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Um, question about um, um, how, you, how you interpret the data. Um, so now I'm, your, now I'm a big uh, Philips transporter, and I start uh, using only green energy. Uh, and I'm also changing my strategy of putting, uh, I don't know, a thousand toothbrushes uh, up to uh, a million toothbrushes, uh, well, not a million, but let's say 2,000 toothbrushes per car. How does that work out in your numbers, and when do you see that in the dashboard? So um, it depends on how many shipments you booked for these 2,000 toothbrush. So uh, we don't count for I, uh, individual items, but we count for uh, in the sh by shipments. So if all these toothbrush are all shipped by one single shipment, then it is counted as one. And then that will be integrated into our system. And say we look at uh, what's the number of weights you specified when you booked the shipment and also look at the origin and destination, review the shipping distance, calculate the mission, and just <coughs> add it up to our existing results. But, and how, how does it work for the, for the green, uh, green energy then? Switching from uh, gray to green, because I guess you have electric yeah. trucks or something as a type somewhere? Yeah, so um, basically uh, the dashboard, this dashboard here serves as a results presenting dashboard. So we'll tell you, we'll be able to tell you that, that um, how many emissions we are generating uh, within a year, within a month, or along which routes. But when it comes to how we improve, it depends on how you look at these data. So we don't actually give out direct suggestions, but we present the result only. I hope that answers your question. Well, m maybe not, but let's talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> you can clarify during coffee break here. Well, <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> okay. So I have two questions. Yeah. The first one is: Do you uh, calculate the return journey because the shipment goes and the car comes back? Um. Well, if it is booked, then we will be accountable for that. Okay, so... So, yeah, I mean, like, because it depends on uh, if our data provider or our carrier, or the carrier of these shipments have provided us the correct um, shipments, like all the shipments are included, and as well as if they are recorded in our data source system. So, as long as they are there, then we definitely calculate them. Okay. Uh, the second one is it's a funny one. Uh, what is your CO2 emission for the project? Like, keep it running. Well, mm, very good question. I would say almost no, because I basically I go to the office by bike, so. <laughs> no, no, I mean the, for keeping the, running the project. Um, running the project, that is a very good question. So. Um, this dashboard runs, like, reloads every, every day on a daily basis, and apparently it consumes electricity for reloading, right? So, I mean, I would suppose that the emission for running this project probably would be equivalent to, I don't know, shipping a package from here to Amsterdam, probably. <laughs> yeah. Several questions. Yeah. 
No, no. Pasha will throw it. Uh, Pasha, you can just throw it to them. Here. Go back. Yeah. I got it. Okay, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I have one question. That is, you said you con I mean, you had a multi-threaded system and you converted to a single-threaded system for removing duplication. So did you consider any other alternative solution to prevent this problem? Uh, what do you mean by any other solution? Like I mean, uh, let's say you are reducing duplicates uh, by making it single-threaded, but it is inherently also reducing the performance of the system. Like it is, it will take longer for processing the data. Did you consider like uh, any other approach? Like let's say based on database, database has an atomic system. Yeah. This kind of things. Uh, like, yeah. did you consider these kind of things? And yeah. maybe you can tell us a little bit about why you didn't consider those systems. Yeah, so uh, what you said is definitely something we are running right now. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately, that the data, uh, these shipment data with FinPhillips are held by different groups, So which doesn't make sense, right? Because they are all shipment data. And so now we are gradually shifting to a solution where we have all the data stored in a data lake, as you suggested. So yeah, you found it. And, um, and the ultimate acceptation from us is to we only load, we just directly load from this cloud storage from this data lake to our system instead of have to gather around with different data providers. So yes, the answer is yes, we are moving forward to that. But since um, the movements from different database it's taking a long while, and we have to validate the process as well. So we thought we should start doing the integration from our side, which is integrating the process here. But yes, we're definitely yeah. on our way. OK, okay good. thank you. Looking, yeah, looking at time, we are running out of time. So there were several questions. I advise to ask it during coffee break. And now we have coffee break in Forhof. Uh, until 11 o'clock, uh, so the speakers, the next speakers, please uh, try out. Enjoy your coffee break, everybody. Yeah.
Okay, so let's uh, start the second session of the Expo Symposium. The next speaker is Sam Limbo, uh, who's going to uh, talk about her work for Philips Research. It's about using AI methods for um, fetal head detection. So enjoy the talk. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. And my name is Sam Nimbo, and I've done my final project with the title of Automated Neural Architecture Search for Fetal Head Detection at Philips Research. And in today's presentation, I, I would like to start by giving the introduction of the project, and then I'll uh, discuss about the neural architecture search in us. Uh, then I'll continue with the AutoDeep Lab, which is the main technique that we used in this project. And uh, finally, I can share the uh, final results of the project. Uh, uh, as you might know, uh, Philips Research is a part of Philips, and they uh, focus, uh, focus on healthcare innovations, and they are highly interested in deep learning to improve people's lives. Um, and uh, Philips Research's main goal is to uh, improve people's lives around the world, um, and uh, one of the aspects uh, of improving people's lives is to reduce mortality rate during labor. And in order for a successful delivery, uh, we need uh, ultrasound imaging equipment and the sonographer. Uh, however, uh, uh, <coughs> however um, the, ult uh, the ultrasound imaging is out of reach for most pregnant women in under-resourced communities because it required that the inexpensive uh, uh, ultrasound imaging equipment and the trained sonographer. That's why there are <coughs> a higher number of mortality rates uh, of uh, babies and their mothers. Uh, and their mothers. Okay? And in order to address this problem, uh, we developed the deep learning model that automatically detects the uh, fetus position uh, from ultrasound images. Uh, and uh, that is the, uh, one of the goals in this project, fetal anatomy detection. And there is one more uh, important goal is to implement uh, neur uh, neural architecture search, NAS, and, uh, for, the, for the deep learning. So we use the deep learning model, the uh, neural network architecture. And now we look into that. Uh, so therefore, we have two main goals. And uh, one is the fetal anatomy detection, so that we uh, just know about. And then uh, the other one is the NAS implementation. So now what is NAS? And the NAS is a neural architecture search uh, which automatically searches uh, neural network architecture for a given data set. Uh, therefore, the AI engineer can create their own neural network architecture uh, uh, for their tasks. Um, <coughs> Uh, therefore, the uh, Philips Research wanted to implement and evaluate NAS for their machine learning projects. And there are three uh, main benefits of NAS. And the first one is the automation of designing neural architecture. And since it is uh, searched automatically, it, it automates the approach of manual design. And the second, exploration of new architecture. Uh, when we designed the neural network ar architecture, uh, we mostly reuse the uh, previously known architectures. So instead of that, we will create a novel uh, neural network architecture uh, for our own tasks. And the third one is the reduction of experimentation time. So it's at, uh, since it's automating the approach, it reduces the experimentation time for searching the appropriate architecture uh, for, for, for our tasks. Okay, so and for the NAS implementation, we use the two different data sets. One is the Lumify, 
and the other one is the cipher 10. And the, <coughs> the lumified data set was provided by the Philips Research, and it has the ultrasound images with 23-week fetus, uh, 23 week uh, fetus, and uh, it includes three uh, classes, head, body, and spine, uh, and it's image segmentation problem. So image segmentation means it, is, it takes the position of the object. And the next one is the uh, Cypher 10 dataset, which is an open source dataset, and it's an image classification task. So classification task, it doesn't detect the object position in the image, but it detects the uh, what is in the image? So these two different uh, these two data sets are the for different tasks, and the Cypher 10 has the 10 different classes: uh, airplane, uh, like airplane, aeromobile, bird, cat, etc. And uh, so uh, those those two are the main data sets, and uh, our our two main goal is. Uh, uh, have the two different target users. And then <coughs> for the NAS implementation, uh, for NAS uh, implementation will help the AI engineers to create their own neural network architecture without spending too much time searching the, uh, uh, the optimal neural network architecture for their tasks. And the fetal anatomy detection will help the pregnant woman to avoid labor complication during uh, labor. Uh, so these two uh, users are the target us users of this project. And now let's uh, discuss about more uh, the NAS. And <coughs> in order to develop the deep learning model, we need to create neural network architecture as uh, shown here. But uh, designing the such architecture is always challenging uh, because there are countless number of possibilities. So. Uh, because of that, and so, in, and so in order to implement such an architecture, the, it's very time-consuming and it requires the experienced machine, experienced machine learning engineer. Therefore, in order to address this problem, the NAS is introduced in the machine learning field. So in other words, um, AI, uh, that creates AI. <coughs> and moreover, the NAS is a... Uh, uh, NAS is a part of very big concept, automated machine learning, and it's a subset of hyperparameter optimization. So AutoML is automating the every aspect of the machine learning uh, to improve efficiency. So therefore, the non-experts can apply the machine learning uh, to, their, to their tasks. So if we look into the detailed uh, diagram, <coughs> here is the machine learning workflow. And the input is the raw data, and it go to data cleaning, feature preprocessing, model selection, and hyperparameter optimization. And the output is model validation. And the AutoML is automating every steps in machine learning workflow. And the uh, the automation of the model selection is named as the NAS, and it is a subset of hyperparameter optimization. And in this project, uh, we are uh, fo we focused on the NAS. Uh, therefore, the hyperparameter optimization is uh, out of scope in this project. Uh, and the NAS is an um, uh, active area of research, and it is growing uh, really fast since 2017. And in 2017, there there is a paper named "Neural Architecture Search with Reinforcement Learning." was published from Google Brain, and this paper is quite famous in the NAS, between the NAS papers because they used the uh, extensive computational power of Google to evaluate their neural output of their neural network architecture of their methods. So uh, in total, there were 12,800 architectures to evaluate, and it required the 800 GPUs, GPUs in 28 days. Since then, the main, uh, many papers have been published to uh, explore more efficient approaches for the NAS. And however, the most papers only uh, focused on the cell, uh, cell, cell structure, like searching on the cell structure, so which means uh, the outer network structure is fixed and there is no upsampling and downsampling rates. Uh, therefore, uh, it's more suitable for the only the image classification, but not that suitable for the image segmentation, because image segmentation we need to keep the high spatial resolution. So 
who uh, in order to uh, uh, therefore the author diplop is proposed in the in this field and then we chose the author diplop because it searches the uh, network uh, level architecture as well as the cell structure simultaneously and if we look into the network level search space we have the down sampling rate from 1 to 20 32 and the horizontally horizontally we have the um, uh, horizontally horizontally we have the oh my gosh. Uh, horizontally we have the uh, network layer uh, in our case it is at 12 in default and uh, at the beginning of the network uh, search, lev search space we have the three stem cells those are the fixed and in total, we have uh, 45 blue cells. Those structures are searched during the training. And the gray arrow represents the transition probability, so which, uh, uh, which is optimized during the training. And at the end, we have the ASPP model. And if we look into the what is in the stem cell, and in the stem cell, we have uh, convolution with patch norm and ReLU activation. And this is the one of the stem cells. And if we look into the uh, all three stem cells, and those uh, stem cells structures are exactly same. Now we know what is in the stem cells. Now let's look into the blue cells. So if we chose the blue cell here in the highlighted rate, red, the output of the uh, blue cell uh, is uh, dependent on its previous two cell, and also its upper left and lower left. Uh, cells, and if we uh, zoom in and uh, zoom in to uh, narrow down perspective, the our chosen cell is highlighted in red, and the other important cells are um, highlighted in uh, respectively in their colors. And in the in the cell in each cell we have five blocks, and then each block have two inputs from its previous cell and also inputs from its previous blocks. And this is the general connection in the, uh, between the blocks in the cell. <coughs> um, and if we look into the what is in the uh, block, uh, and each block, has, each block has three inputs and then each input has eight operations. And then uh, each, each operation has the um, um, oper uh, operation probability that will optimize during the training and the set of operation is uh, added at the end in element wise addition and uh, and in general the optimization goes with the three parameters and then um, first one is the uh, network weight so while the uh, cell and network architecture probabilities are fixed, the network weight is optimized, and then when the weight is optimized, the other two parameters are optimized. So during the training, we, are, we, are opt we optimize the, uh, all three uh, pa parameters together. Okay, so now we are going through the uh, final results, and um, here is a uh, uh, here is the Lumify result, and this is the ar uh, network architecture that we found for the Lumify dataset. And uh, 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 at the bottom, the cell structure of the um, of the Lumi uh, of the network architecture. And the table is represent is the our final res final final result for the Lumify dataset, and the final result is 91.62 MIOU. And if we uh, look into the sanity check, and the first column represents the input image, and the uh, second column represents the ground truth, which is labeled by human expert, and the third um, column represents the predicted mask, in other words, our result of our model. And if we uh, compare to the two, uh, two uh, ground truth mask and predicted mask, those are quite similar. Uh, and this is uh, and quite similar. And if we look into the incorrect uh, predictions, so if we compare to the ground truth mask and predicted mask, and those two results are quite different. But when we look in, uh, close into the input image, actually, actually, the our result is uh, uh, predicted correctly. 
So which means our model works better than the human. Um, uh, and so here is the final result of the cipher 10 data set. And then cipher 10 data set we uh, implemented in, in two different cases. One is the auto deep lab is 12 layer network and the other one is the six layer. And <coughs> uh, 12 layer means the network uh, layer is 12 until here and the six is the here, short, short one. And if we compare to the cell structure between the net 12 layer and six, six layers, and then in the 12 layer we have a lot of escape connections and only three uh, operations in 12 layer. And uh, for the six layer we have only two escape connections and the others are the operations. So which means Autotip Lab set the more operation in the shorter path in the network and then less operations in the longer path uh, in, the, in the network level arch architecture. And for the uh, final uh, result, uh, we have <coughs> for the six layer network, we got the 95.12% uh, accuracy. And for the 12 layer network, we have 94.20% accuracy. So, which means the auto deep lab can find the optimal architecture uh, based on the given network layer. Uh, okay, here is an animation uh, which shows the how Autodip Lab searches the optimal architecture during the training, and the why, uh, when we epoch, ep while the epoch changes, the it searches the more optimal architectures architecture for the data set. And yeah, uh, so that's all about the project, and I share uh, lessons that I learned during the training, and. <coughs> um, the for, uh, for me, like, the most important thing is for uh, the defining the project scope as clearly as possible. Possible, so it can like help you, uh, like guide you to plan, and then also uh, help you to finish your project successfully. So, in in my case, in my <coughs> DU supervisor is really helped to uh, define the scope very clearly. So I am really thankful for that. And uh, the next important thing is the project planning, uh, especially for me. So I had my wedding in August, and then I, I also, my, uh, my project is started quite late because of the company authorization. So I got my <coughs> laptop and, in, uh, and email account in around in March. So I really had to plan like concrete. So the project planning was very, very important. And the uh, next one is the risk management plan. Uh, yeah, risk management plan is like mitigating the risks, but I notice one more thing is like being aware of the risks is really make you confident with your project. So the risk management was helpful. And at the end, the buffer time. So uh, I think the really important th thing when you do the project planning, uh, you, you really need some buffer time at the end of your project. So even you have the risk management and you mitigate the all risks, but uh, there might be a risk that you cannot see. So for example, when I uh, came back from my vacation and uh, my account was uh, locked, so it just didn't, add, so I don't have any access to my laptop and anything, so my defense is in, uh, <coughs> in uh, October, so it was really tense, but um, yeah, so buffer time is really, uh, really important for at the end of, the, of your project. Yeah, yeah, that's all, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elsa. So, questions? Oh my God! <laughs> Catch. Excited. Okay. Thank you. Very nice presentation and very nice work. Um, I have a question about validation. So you validated your results against the annotation that the, the domain experts already did. But I was wondering if you did some kind of validation against the current available models because you got 96% uh, of accuracy, which is really good. But I'm uh, I'm thinking if it takes so much time and energy to 
uh, find a proper architecture using AutoDeepLab, isn't it better to just ask a domain expert to design a model instead? Uh, I'm not sure how, how better is it uh, compared to the current available models. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, actually, I didn't present it here, but we compared the result with the unit. Okay. <laughs> and then, yes, and because I thought it might be not that interesting, so I removed it. But uh, the model was the uh, same as the unit, and but it, the uh, model size is two times smaller than the unit. Okay. So it is still um, more efficient. Okay. Because at the end, we will also use it in the mobile device, so the smaller model is very valuable. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You can throw it. You told me. Uh, hello, I, I want to ask a question about uh, how you decide uh, uh, the activation functions and uh, normalizations. Uh, I mean, there's another choice like the layer normalizations, the uh, the, the linear functions, the sigmoid. Uh, is there any experiment how the, the effects of the such things will be uh, diminished through the architecture search? Uh, uh, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Are you mean that how are you decide to use the yeah, how, how do you select, and then, select uh, yes. the normalizations, the activation functions? Uh -huh. Is there any pre-experiment or yeah. it will be diminished Actually, we, by the... Uh, yeah. We follow the auto lab, but the auto lab is based on the previous works, uh, uh, previous works uh, approach, the radio activation and the norm normalization, and those are uh, like shown quite uh, good in the previous papers. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, it's inherited it. Yeah. from the previous uh, works. May, may, may you share, share some experience about the uh, uh, network training because I <laughs> previously also trained some deep learning networks uh, also in the NIS, but the, the, the results is not so good. So uh, what's your initial uh, parameter size strategies or the learning rate strategies or, or, or something else? May, may you share some more details about Sorry, could you repeat it again? <laughs> yeah. So, 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 can can you share some uh, specific details about the uh, uh, strategies of the training? Ah, strategy of the training. Yes. Mm, it's um, like after finding the neural network architecture. So, it, uh, I just followed the, as what we do in, during the training, like hyperparameter optimization. I have to do, and then everything is like what we do in during the training. So what, how specific do you want? Uh, okay, that's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lichun, uh, for your presentation. Did you also consider recall or precision for measuring the accuracy of uh, your model? Or precision? Not? Yeah? Precision and recall, or uh -huh. only accuracy? Ah, it's MIOU. So for the, I, uh, I implemented in two cases. One is the uh, uh, for, uh, class image classification, the other one the image segmentation. So image segmentation, <laughs> we use the MIOU. So it's mean intersectional union. So it's like uh, if, if the object, object is, if the, they're overlapped with the ground truth, it's uh, close to one. The, uh, in other case, it's close to zero. So it's really, it's always the main, uh, main metric for the segmentation task. For the accuracy, we used, uh, for the image uh, classification, we use the accuracy. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Also, uh, one question about performance. That uh, how did you measure it and uh, how did you compare it with other models? Did you uh, just... Uh, uh, compare it with one specific model or multiple models, and what kinds of metrics did you have for measuring the performance of your model? Uh, uh, we, uh, we only compared with the unit, so it's uh, really also the famous in the field, right? And then uh, for the measurement, every, in the end, every parameter is the same as the unit, and um, the metric is the same as the MIOU. And then uh, we also compared with the model size and the accuracy. 
Thank you. I also one another question. Uh, did you also consider reinforcement learning to maybe underpin your model uh, uh, sorry? with NAS or not? Did you also consider reinforcement learning in uh, combination with your uh, model? Or no, no, no uh, because in the previous NAS papers, they, they used the reinforcement learning, but it proven uh, quite uh, time consuming during the training. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, in, in Autodiplop doesn't use the reinforcement learning. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. We are running out of time, so unfortunately we leave uh, uh, the viewers to ask it during the lunch break. Okay, so let's uh, thank Tham, Tham again. Yeah, thank you. So our next speaker um, is Sedehe Araste. Uh, she has done her project at Signify. So Signify is formerly known as uh, Philips uh, Lightning, Lighting. And um, as an avid user at home, a uh, Hue Lighting, I'm very excited about her project because she has designed and developed a music light scripting tool for Philips Hue Entertainment. Uh, thank Sorry, you. Is yours? Thank you, Yanja. Uh, welcome everyone, my name is Sefide and today I will present my final project with the title of Philips Hue Entertainment Music Light Scripting Tool. This is the agenda for today's presentation. First, I will introduce the, part, the industrial partner of the project. I will continue about uh, to explain you how this project was initiated. Uh, I will show you some of the prototypes that we, had, we have already had there. Uh, I will talk about the main design choices that we had. I'll continue with the implementation and verification and validation. Next, I will show you two of the demos that I have created with the tool. And finally, I will conclude the project. Signify uh, is the, the industrial partner of this project, and it is well known for, um, which is the world leader for smart home lighting system. This project has been conducted in Hue Entertainment and Partnership Group Inside Hue Connected, their focus is to enhance entertainment for the Hue app users uh, and uh, to synchronize their entertainment with the Hue uh, lights. Uh, here in the bottom uh, corner of the slide, you can see some devices uh, which are some Hue lights together with a Hue bridge. And this device is necessary to be connected on your Wi-Fi network in order to communicate to the Hue lights and send comments to the lights. To explain how this project was initiated, I need to talk about Hue Spotify and its drawbacks that motivated Signify to define this project. Next to that, I can then continue with the project goal and scope, and then finally I will uh, introduce the general requirements of this project. Hue Spotify proposes generating pleasing light effects in synchronization with, uh, with your music while it is streaming uh, in Spotify. It allows Signify to use Spotify-provided metadata uh, accompanying with each song in Spotify database and makes the lights react uh, based on the content which is playing in the Spotify database, in the Spotify streaming tool. The service that we uh, will talk about is the light script generation, which is a service that is responsible for getting information from the metadata and converting them into the light language. This uh, script is totally automatic, so we call it automatic algorithm throughout this presentation. So I talked about metadata. A metadata is just a subsequent description of the song itself, and it, can, it includes some of the musical analysis in, information for each song. As it can be seen here, we have different information about the different sections, beats and bars. So we call this information the audio events. Throughout this presentation, I will talk about the key moments because these are indicators for uh, the algorithm as well as for the light designer that something important is happening throughout the song. And we want to take action and generate some light script for them. And what is the light event? A light event can be a value, a light that its value can change from one value to another value with a certain brightness and a certain color and speed. So, what this uh, algorithm does is that to convert these audio events to the light events. 
Although Hue Spotify has brought innovation to the light uh, experience for the Hue apps users, it still has some drawbacks. The first one is that we are using metadata, but not always these metadata are 100% reliable, and we don't have any human interference to modify them. Also, the, the algorithm is too generic for all type of, uh, types of the song, and also we are missing the human creativity. As a light designer, I might want to add some creativity to the, to the script that I'm generating. And last but not least, that is that we are not considering the user setups. A user might have different light numbers or in the entertainment area, and we are not we are ignoring that. All of these reasons motivated Signify to uh, define this is in this project with the title of Music Light Scripting Tool. So the goal is to use human creativity to manually generate a light script, and we want to use and have some kinds of predefined effect libraries for the scope of the project. Uh, the tool user will be the content light designers in Sox Signify, and we also assume that we have access to the MP3 song, uh, the MP3 form of the song, because as you might know, uh, it is impossible to download a music from from a streaming tool. So we assume that we have access to that. So this is our system of interest. We have the music light scripting tool, which includes. Uh, two different services, script creation and script distribution, and the focus for the scope of the project will be on script creation. Once we have the script created, we can uh, upload it to a DynamoDB, and then the other available services can use it. Next is uh, time for the requirement elicitation phase. We had three different phases of uh, requirement gathering, refinement, and finally we had the minimum viable product meetings that there we discuss about the different requirements that is necessary for, for the first increment of the tool. Here, uh, the use case diagram can be seen, and we have uh, the main important requirements for the tool will be a light designer want to load and visualize the audio uh, form in the tool. And then we also want to have those audio events that we call it key moments, and we want to speci specify it in, in our tool. We want to create and edit the effects. We want to save the current workspace so that the user, the potential user, can work in, uh, in the future. And then finally, we want to save the light script, the, the tool result. And last but not least is that we want to have our device, the bridge, connected so that we can see the results on the real lights. And technology stack for this project is C++ and Qt framework for the UI. Okay, there were a few prototypes inside Signify. Uh, the first one is a tool inspired by Audacity, and it has implemented in Python. Uh, one of the disadvantages here is that it was not satisfying the technical requirements, so we could not continue working on that. And it was also working with uh, fixed light setup. As it can be seen here, we have just six lights. And if we have different light setup in, uh, in our entertainment, we cannot use the result. Then we have something that we call it our base code. It was satisfying all the technical requirements, uh, but it also has some drawbacks that uh, I will explain later. But the good thing here is that uh, it also has bridge connection, so we can, we can connect to the lights and see the results. So we started with enhancing and modifying that base code, trying to modify it as we want, and creating some kinds of timeline and creating some kinds of effects. The, these colorful uh, bars here are the indicators for the effect. But soon we realized that we cannot continue with that, because as a light designer, I want to, control, to have control over all the objects on the screen. And here we were using some kinds of pre-implemented components in Qt, and we could not continue, and we, we did not have that, that much control. So it's time to decide. Uh, we decided to start with a new base code, starting implementing everything ourselves, all the components, because we, for us, that was necessary to have those uh, effects. Also, we, uh, we decided to use EDK library, which is a core library inside Signify, which provides us an API for streaming to the lights, and also it has an enriched library of uh, predefined effects that we can take benefit out of that. 
Inside EDK library, we are using basic pulse effects because we want light designer to have control over the objects. So we want to have uh, to control all the parameters that we have for an effect. But because of that, then it, it might take a lot of time for a light designer to design a light script. Then instead, we uh, introduce some kinds of extra functionalities like, like copy pasting, because then we are helping the light designer to spend less time on creating light script. So also these extra functionalities were not in the list of minimum viable product requirements, but we introduced it to the tool to make the life of the light designers a bit easier. And then we were using Qt Creator as our framework, uh, as our ID for implementation, because we wanted to be able to implement in different operating systems. Now it's time for implementation. It has three main uh, parts. The first one is the main panel, which is mostly responsible for the timeline creation and also the audio visualization. Then we have the, the streaming part and we have the uh, data serialization part. This is the main panel. We have the audio signal visualized here. We have the timeline concepts, which are these black areas. We have the concept of layering and brightness. A brightness, a brightness, can, brightness timeline can control the, uh, the total brightness of our script and is behaving like a dimmer for us. And we have the layering, which means that when we have the, the, the timeline, which is in higher level, has more priority to be played and rendered on the, real li in, on the lights. We have these effects that we can, the user can add it to the timelines. And then we have these vertical lines, which are the indicators for the key moments or audio events. And finally, we have access to all the parameters for the basic pulse effect that we are using. And then we have this area here, which EDK library itself is responsible for converting them into the, uh, into the area that we have in the user setup. I talked about the functionalities that we have it added. Uh, I will show you a simulation video here. So we can choose it and then select Control C and then paste it. We can resize them. We can move them. Also, multi-selection is possible with clicking the shift, cl uh, shift clicking and pressing it. And then multi-copy pasting because a song might have different kinds of repetitive pattern that we want to copy it somewhere else. So we can just create a script for the uh, short period of the song and then copy it. And then we can also remove it. For the bridge connection, again, we have a, a video here. The tool can search for and uh, look for a bridge once we, uh, it finds the bridge connected to the tool and to the Wi Fi. Uh, it asks us to press the push link button. And then once we do that, we will be connected to, to the bridge. And we can see the list of entertainment area here that is something that we have set it in the Hue app. Once we are connected to the bridge, when we press the play button, it will play the um, music as well as the light script. And then the light script will be play, rendered on the, on the right itself. And then if we don't want to stream it, we can easily just press stop streaming. Then we have the data serialization part, because we want to have all the data uh, about the current workspace being saved. Uh, so the main three buttons, the main first buttons are responsible for loading the light script and also creating a new one. We have the timeline here that we can add as many as timelines that we want. We have the media buttons here, and we have zooming in and out functionalities, because we want to have a more precise script. That was all about the implementation, about the verification and validation. So the first one is that like all the developers, we have the console logs, it's obvious. And then uh, we also have, the, uh, we are saving all the information in JSON files as well as, well as the light, uh, the light uh, JSON script. So once something is not working, we can easily understand because we can see everything being rendered on, on the lights. It's a kind of system testing for us. And then we have some kinds of unit tests. We were following the model uh, view controller design. So for model and controller part that is implemented in C++, we have the unit testing for that. For the view part, uh, 
squish framework is suggested, but because it's not free and it is under license, we could not uh, continue for that. So that was one of the reasons that we came up with some kinds of manual testing and exploratory testing. We had 12 different uh, test scenarios and each has uh, different test cases. And then we were checking if we are meeting all the functional requirements based on the UI or not. And then we have the non-functional requirements. We wanted to have the two results to be more adjustable to the sync in comparison to the automatic algorithm. In the first demo that I've shown to the uh, stakeholders, I created a demo for 30 sec seconds of a sign, and there I created a light script, which was even taking action for different sections of one individual uh, word. Uh, we have ease of use uh, or user-friendly, uh, the first increment of the tool that we delivered to the stakeholders, after that we received some feedback from the stakeholders and we applied all of them, such as uh, removing the extra clicking requirements and also the, mostly about the appearance of the tool. And then we have the portability. We wanted, to, uh, be, uh, we wanted uh, the tool to be installable on different operating systems. Our tool is being able to be installed on Windows and Linux, but unfortunately, because we are using Qt 5 to be compatible with the other codes of the system, uh, and inside that there is a component that we are using, and it is called multimedia. The encoder in that is not being supported by a Mac operating system. So that was the only requirement that have not been met uh, based on our uh, requirement list. That was all about the testing. Now it's time for demo. I have added two of the uh, demos that I've created. The first one is uh, the thing that uh, the first demo that I created, that is with the first version of the tool that requires more uh, clicking. Uh, I can play it now. So you can see that the light is following. The That was the first demo. Uh, you can see here that we have more clicking requirements for, for the creating of the effects. And then the next demo. Bitch, I might be better. Turn up the music. Turn down the lights. I've got a feeling I'm going to be all right. Okay. All right. It's about damn time. Turn up the music. Let's celebrate. That was all about the demo, and to conclude, the list of deliverables was the music light scripting tool itself and its installer files, also the documentation and instruction, how to create an installer file, how to use the tool for the potential users, and then finally we have four sample scripts, each for 30 seconds of a sign. And then the lesson that I have learned. Actually, it is a long list of the lessons that I've learned throughout these 10 months of the project. I just included the main important one here. Uh, first of all, I will say for, for the uh, juniors, I will say don't underestimate the task. Always allocate some time for unexpected events because sometimes you cannot uh, even have a risk plan there are some, as Lima also said, there are some risks that you cannot uh, see it beforehand. And then communication is the key. The com well, communication, I will say, also the transparency. And there are also always some domain experts can, can always help you to speed up because not all the projects are research-based. So my project, for example, we needed a lot of domain knowledge and with no internet resources. Uh, that was a bit difficult to start at, this, uh, at the starting period, but finally uh, everything went well. That was all about my presentation.
Thank you for listening to them, listening to me. If you have any question, go ahead, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sepulte. We are thank all you. excited to have your product at home so that our neighbors don't sleep at all. <laughs> you know, very nice. Um, any questions? Okay. I have one. I also. <laughs> So you mentioned uh, two code bases uh, mm -hmm. at the beginning. I want to ask if you go back in time, uh, can you say what will help you to choose the better one, which was in your case the second one? Yeah, good question indeed. Actually, I would say if I want to go back, uh, I won't jump into the implementation from the first day because we had this base code ready and uh, we thought that it's already good, it has Bridge connected, and we can, can uh, we can uh, create an effect, and it is satisfying all the technology requirements. Uh, and I was trying to do whatever I wanted with that tool, but then it was after three months of the project that I realized that although I spent a lot of time on enhancing the tool as we wanted, but we were not able to do that because then again it has some drawbacks. Uh, maybe it is better if I started maybe spending some time trying to digest all the information that I get from the domain experts, because I was always uh, part of the team and they helped me a lot. Uh, but I also needed some time to, to understand all the information myself, because I had no domain background about that and no uh, domain knowledge. But yeah, thank you for the question. Um. Well, uh, the lights were really cool, first of all. And I've got two questions. First one is like, can it be integrated with Alexa and Google, uh, Google Hub? Uh, and my second question is that when this uh, product gonna be available to the consumers? So yeah. Uh, the tool, you mean? Uh, sorry, for, can, can you repeat the first question? So can this be integrated with Alexa and Google, uh, Google Hub? because uh, I've got these similar lights as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I do is like, if I want to turn the lights on, I just say the command, uh, hey, hey, uh, hey Google, can, can you kindly turn on the lights? And it mm -hmm. automatically turns on the lights. But if, for example, if I want to integrate these kind of system in my Google Hub or maybe to Alexa, can it be possible? Uh, actually, this tool is for now a standalone tool, so it's not connected to the Q Cloud, so we can, you cannot see the result. But as you remember, might remember that Music Light Scripting tool has also that script distribution included. Once we have everything and we are sure that we ensure that okay, it's good enough, we can uh, upload it to the database, and then there, instead of for now, it's just. Uh, running the automatic algorithm, and but how we thought about that is that we can we have an ID for each sign, and it is unique for each sign. Uh, so once we have the script for that created and is already available in the database, instead of running that automatic algorithm, we can uh, use this script that is already there. Uh, fair enough. And when this gonna be launching to the consumers? <laughs> because I'm waiting for this. <laughs> yeah, we, we should ask Signify about that. But we are just for now. They are just exp exploring to see if it is indeed. Uh, I think, for example, a user study will be required to see if actual view app are more satisfied with the result of this music light scripting tool or for the automatic algorithm, and then it, go, it can go to the market. Oh, and your all. next question was? Uh, the, these were two only. Oh, OK. Questions. Thanks Great. a lot. Thank you. Arnab has a question. Thank you. Thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I have uh, one question, that is, you said that uh, there are problems with multiple lights when like copy pasting some uh, same scripts and and so forth then uh, my question is why did you choose qt and c++ instead uh, you could have used like let's say uh, maybe a web based technology where you can do these things much more easier uh, or it could be much more helpful for you to have multiple light configured in that platform mm -hmm. Good question indeed. Uh, for C++, because all of the other codes were also implemented in Signify, uh, in Signify were also implemented in C++, and we wanted to be compatible with all of those base codes. Uh, but for the UI, as we uh, searched and we found it, 
that was one of the uh, best UI framework that we could use. But I think also Signify is still open for, all, for the future work might be that, that we can explore the more uh, possibilities maybe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sipide. It's a nice presentation. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, like, uh, in using Python implementation, so it, uh, you say that it is possible to control at my uh, six slides. Mm -hmm. So how so how did you scale your um, your model uh, to control more lights than the than the six lights? Uh, in in my tool, actually, one of the reasons that we were using that EDK library. Uh, in that slide that I was talking about the main functionalities in the tool, we are using the basic pulse effect that is already available in EDK library. And EDK library has all the things, and it is taking care of that uh, converting the, our setup into lights language. Mm -hmm. So we might have more than six lights or even more, and then we are categorizing everything in, a, in our Hue app. That is something that the, all the Hue app users are doing for the entertainment. And then EDK is responsible for, for categorizing all of those lights into different areas. So when, then when I uh, say, OK, I want these lights to be rendered on the, uh, on the um, center area, for example, it doesn't matter if I have three or four lights and there, because then EDK library is responsible for converting those center, that is uh, the area that is center, to the uh, to the number of the lights that are there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sepeda. Thank again. you. So uh, let's uh, thank the speakers. So now we are starting with the lunch. Uh, it's in the same place in Forhof uh, until one o'clock. And afterwards, we're going to start with the last batch of the Expo Symposium. So see you at one o'clock. Enjoy your lunch.
Last but not least. Last best. Are you nervous? No, I'm good. Make him nervous. Are <laughs> <laughs> you not nervous? That is okay. <laughs> So, let's start the final phase of the Expo Symposium. We are going to have three presentations, starting with TomTom, -tom and then uh, Canon printing, and, and we finalize with uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Our first speaker for the last session is Dan uh, Hirasku. Hirasku. <laughs> and uh, uh, he's going to talk about his book for TomTom -tom on safety by design. Thank you, Yanja. Yes, it's working. Hello, everyone. Hope you enjoyed lunch, because the fun starts again. Um, welcome also to those who are watching online. My name is Dan Kirosko, and I'd like to tell you a short story of safety by design and how a commercial software company specializing in navigation, TomTom, Tom sought to understand it and integrate it in its software development process. And the story goes like this. I'll start with the need for safety. So why do you need uh, safety, specifically in the automotive domain? <clears throat> then the goal of the project given this need for safety. Then the process itself, a bit of theory, right, so we can understand what, what do you have to do, right, for, for your system to be considered safe. And then the fun part, the application on an actual proof of concept. And then the results and lessons learned. So I'm going to start with a few car manufacturers, or OEMs as they're called. We have Toyota, Tesla, Mercedes, uh, for example. So these are just a few examples among many. For example, how uh, Toyota had to recall almost half a million vehicles in April of 2022, so this year, uh, because uh, th there was a bug in the skid control software. Tesla also does a lot of over-the-air updates, right? It's a very high-tech experimental car, but that doesn't really fix the, the f fundamental uh, issue of, of, of safety, right? And of a safety process in your software development. For Mercedes, they had an issue also in April with um, a software supplier for the rear view camera uh, because what happened is the software supplier did not provide a good failure mechanism. And uh, what happened was uh, the frame the frame froze, and that can be a bit dangerous because the driver can think that uh, right, you're, you're further away than <laughs> where you are and you can hit something. So uh, a, a few examples there, and these are a few among many, so you can imagine that a, a lot of uh, things can happen some of which are dangerous. And so what does the automotive industry do? Well, not just uh, <laughs> automotive, but you have these uh, levels, right? Uh, ASOs, automotive safety and integrity levels. And I'll just briefly explain them. It's not too complicated. So you have QM, the very green one, which stands for quality management. This one does not enforce uh, uh, safety, uh, so to speak, but it recommends it because ultimately safety is just better quality. Then you have the A to AB category, which targets in information. So the driver is informed about the surrounding environment and lighting, but does not control the vehicle directly and doesn't control stuff like airbags that ensures passenger safety, which is uh, for level C and D. And here we have a bunch of examples. Maybe you've seen such, such a high-tech car with a bunch of interesting functions here. So we have the higher ASOS airbag, which is ASOS D, radar, cruise control, electric power steering, which control the car, so C and D. The ones that are highlighted are the instrument cluster, which is that thing behind the steering wheel. You used to have the speed dials, right, and, and, and the fuel levels there. Uh, but now it's, it's digital and it supports functions that fall into this category, which is Vision ADOS, or Advanced Driver Assistance System. And uh, that one uh, shows you, for example, the cars uh, around your car, and uh, it, it guides you with a high accuracy, shows you what's in your blind spot. And here we can see, we can see an example of such a cluster. 
right? So, so we, we see it's the very digital. Uh, you have the speed here, the charge, the music, and you, you also have this uh, application which we call lane level guidance. You can see the car is guided with high accuracy. Usually up until now you have like, right, you, you just have like a road level, you don't really see the lanes. And here you even have a part in red, I hope it's visible, right? And that's what we call blind spot highlighting. And it's actually what we're gonna focus on because it's intuitively safety related. Uh, yes, and here we have a representation of a system, very simple one, right, composed of software, operating system, and hardware. And uh, commercial companies, uh, what is good for them to understand when they come into safety is that it's done at a system level, so uh, the entire system supports a given function. So no matter if you specialize on one of these parts, you can't delegate safety to, to the other one, typically, because all of them participate, right, to the realization of the function, the safe realization of your function. And so, uh, what happens um, in, in the case of TomTom, Tom, the context is a bit like this. So here I, I, I show a very highly simplified diagram. You have the vehicle uh, here on the left, it's just a square, right? But this represents sort of the, the entire vehicle. So you have the sensors, the other devices, the in-vehicle network, which feeds information. For example, blind spot information can also be stuff coming through the internet from high definition maps, right? Uh, into your, your cluster. So your cluster somehow is going to have some uh, hardware, an operating system uh, or more. And uh, uh, this operating system is going to support uh, your software. Right, so, so you have the vehicle that feeds uh, your application, and uh, this is a quite, I would say, a very minimal architecture of a data input, so you, you take the data, and then data processing, you make sense out of it, and then render, you output it after you've made sense out of it on a screen. So that's pretty much the, the context, but uh, the focus of TomTom is, is on software, mostly, so because it's a software company, so given this focus on software, the goal of the project is to understand the methods and impact of safety by design on TomTom Tom software development, right? Because TomTom, Tom, uh, as, as, it, as it wants to provide lane level guidance services, uh, blind spot highlighting uh, applications, things like that, uh, we need to understand what we're getting ourselves into and we need to understand right, the these, this safety practice of automotive in, in the A, B level category. Right, so here I'm going to talk a bit about the process. These next couple of slides are going to be a bit of theory, but I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to make it as simple as possible. So you start with something which is called the safety concept, right? And, and this, is, um, this matches the, the requirements phase, you know, the very conceptual phase where you don't really have a, a system yet or a design yet. You just write your requirements, but you summarize them sort of to like a, a, an intended function. And for a blind spot highlighting, well, straightforward, highlight a blind spot area and then some other details whenever the input data report it as occupied, but that's your intended function. And the, the security, um, sorry, the safety counterpart is, is obtained for a process known as um, HARA, or hazard analysis and risk assessment. So uh, again, fancy term, but it's really simple. Hazard analysis, right? Well, what could you possibly do? Well, you, you think about the hazards that could happen. Imagine if, if, if your system somehow fails and doesn't show a car in the blind spot, and a driver, well, it's a, he's a bit more, or she's a bit more clumsy, and uh, they drive into the other vehicle. Right, so, so of course, safety goal, very simple. You want to ensure that the blind spot area is hi highlighted correctly and with a given fault tolerant time interval, or you, you just want it to happen fast enough, basically, right? Because if it's too late, it's too late. And uh, this is given an ACLB. Uh, ACL level is determined by severity and uh, the possibility to avoid it and, and also the chance of it occurring. So these three things that you sort of add up. But because of the high severity uh, of a possible accident in the worst case, because we consider worst case scenarios, you reach ACLB. And finally, uh, so actually next after this, you do a system design. And this is where system level safety comes in. So again, this great design that we have here. And through a process with a different name, but to some extent similar to the HARA, uh, called the FMEA, some of you have already heard of it, failure mode and effects analysis, you think what can go wrong in, in, uh, in your system, and you, and, and you give it a, a, a helper, a safety mechanism. And in the case of ACLB, so keeping ACLB goal in mind, it's sufficient for you to check for errors. So you can have errors at the reading, at the data, at uh, timestamps, right? So if, if it doesn't happen fast enough, you can think of whatever you want here, right? The point of the project was not to go in depth and make a super accurate, super fancy design and safety mechanism, but was to understand this process. And, and so, so this is the process that you have here. So after you've done your design, right? So after you know what your system is and kind of like what your safety goal is, uh, and you have uh, you design everything your 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 system your safety mechanism, and then of course you want to implement it. 
But the story doesn't end here because, well, as we know, for implementation we have testing for a reason, because the implementation most times is not right right from the beginning. And you have testing static and code analysis. Uh, yeah, my colleague from Thermo Fisher also mentioned it here, and I'm going to stress it a bit because right, uh, commercial software companies typically don't do this, uh, to my knowledge. Right. Uh, for testing, it has to be a, a bit, uh, for SOB, it has to be a bit more thorough. You need 100% branch coverage. And then uh, you do static code analysis with, re with the relevant rules that you have in your ISO 26262 standard. This is actually, I've been describing the ISO 26 standard right, uh, so far. But you also uh, have to take into consideration the rules that are important to your stakeholder. For example, a, a car manufacturer can have certain rules for safety and security that they find relevant. So you also consider those ones. Okay, great. So that was the theory. And now for the fun part, we have here the, the proof of concept. So if you recall the, the architecture of the input and processing and rendering, uh, this is a, right, a prototype that runs in a browser and the GUI looks something like this, right? And the input, so this is sort of on the right side, the output, but uh, the input looks something like this. Some of you may already know this. It's a CAN log file where you have CAN data. Looks very cryptic, but I'll just simplify it for you. So here you have this L, which stands for the left side blind spot, and message 44A here, if you can see, it has a bit one here, which, which means that there's something on the left side. Here, 44C has a one, which means something on the right side, and here both of them have one, which is left plus right. And as you can imagine, there's such a sequence of events where something shows off on left and on right, and then left plus right. I use some images from the TomTom Tom Indigo digital cockpit. You can check out the website. It looks great. Um, and so, so we've seen a scenario where, you, where things, well, run, uh, run smoothly, and now I, I'm going to insert some errors. So you have an error, for example, a message is not re recognized at E305, we don't know what's up with that. And then data error, the data is too large or too, too little for, for a given uh, CAN frame. And yeah, the idea is uh, you want to show some kind of warning. Uh, for, for, the, for our scope, it, it didn't really matter, it, it didn't have to be a fancy warning. Of course, in an actual vehicle, you're not going to get that yellow thing in the corner. <laughs> uh, yeah, but, but uh, the important part is that, that we have to understand is that you, you want to make sure that your safety mechanism warns the user to check right, the, the rear uh, view mirrors and, and things like that. Yeah, so, so, so that's, that's it. It, um, it, it was quite straightforward, right? The process and the proof of concept so, so far has been quite simple. You, you make that design and you sort of prototype it and you see that it works. And then you want to see what you find out. And so I'm going to talk a bit about static code analysis. Here we're going to see some quirky, hopefully fun examples with code. And uh, yeah, uh, here we have some code, uh, right? So we can see that it's taken from the Autosar C++14 rule set, because I wrote right, my code in, in this language. And it's rule A471, whatever. So you, so you can see you have these rules in, in, in certain standards for certain programming languages. And you don't have to look at all the details because I'm going to highlight them for you. So here, for example, you have the 64-bit convert converted to a 32-bit. And what does that do? It leads to data loss. Right? So if, of course, if you take something from a larger container and put it into a smaller thing, you, you're going to lose some data. And then uh, here, here is the actual code. Um, and and what, what does it look like? Again, you don't need to understand what it does, uh, right? So, so don't spend time on that because what's important is the principle that happens here. So this looks like this something, so variable equals a complex function. So the n bytes is going to take the return value of read, which can be a complex function. It can span multiple files. It can return some weird structure that can vary in size. And, and so your static code analysis tool can detect that and, and tell you hey, be careful because this function might return something that may lead to data loss. And, and this can be hard to track in complex code especially, right? So if you have complex code, it can be confusing. And now a uh, second and last example, quite a quirky one. So <laughs> again, looks complicated, but I'm just going to simplify it to, to the statement here. So it says you're initializing a variable, whatever variable receiver socket, without using braced initialization. Going a bit back to grade school and high school, uh, Remember when we wrote <laughs> this for, for the first times, right? The, in my end equals 3.14. Yeah, it looks kind of silly, right? Because so the programmers might be raising an eyebrow. Like, what are you doing? Why are you putting a float into an integer? What's going to happen if I output this, right? If I give the C out, it's going to give free. I can also uh, do it with uh, round brackets. I get the same thing. But if I do it with uh, these ones, with the glorious uh, curly brackets, the compiler is going to go, eh, problem. 
never in conversion, right? And you might think this is very silly. Who, who puts 3.14 in an integer? I mean, come on. But again, like you, you have you have something uh, could be a complex function, and you don't know what it returns, right? So so it can be a structure where an object where you have a, I don't know an array, and that array is arbitrarily long, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so, so these are just a few examples among many. You can learn a lot of things, especially if you're passionate about programming, with just by doing static code analysis. You can also educate and fix errors very, very soon. Uh, moving on, so that has been about, about the proof of concept, about its code, right? Sort of like the, the application part. And now after we do the applications, well, what did we learn? Let's see uh, how, what's the extra cost of, of doing safety by design. So you have to do the FMEA in the design phase. And then in a coding phase, you do static code analysis, and then during testing, you ramp it up from 80%, which is the case for TomTom, Tom, can be different in the case of another company to 100%. And so you're gonna, uh, we estimate 20 to 25% extra cost in the long run. So how do we get this, this number here? In my own personal case, right, so if we recall the three phases, the safety concept, and then the design, and then the implementation, right, the software safety part, uh, these three phases, the concept, we, we, we don't really consider it because we assume that it's done in parallel by the safety engineer. The safety engineer know how, how to write a good safety goal and then sort of track it with the development team that they can handle that. But the development team is going to uh, have to help with the FMEA and with the static code analysis and testing. Right? So if you take these two, um, for the proof of concept, the non-safety part, which was the design, and the implementation, uh, it took around 67%. And the safety part, which was the, the FMEA and the static code analysis, took around 32%. And so visually, it looks something like this. And well, you can see safety is actually half of non-safety. It's not 20, 25%, minus 50%. But why is that? Well, because I'm, I'm learning this, right? The, the company is also learning this to a large extent, uh, right? Getting used to it. So. You have to solve the knowledge uh, issue, but also the technical debt because, for example, for a static code analysis tool, I had to use a configuration from a complex project and move it to my project, and it took a lot of extra work. But when you have your configuration done right, you, you can have that ready made and also correct it in real time so you can imagine the effort for that sort of goes to zero. Right? And when uh, the effort for that, for the static code analysis uh, scan and, and solving of issues, because your pro programmers are also going to learn how to write safe code, and you're going to get it in real time. So, you know, like when your IDE tells you, hey, you forgot a semicolon, you're going to get that, but for static code analysis rules as well. And this is what it will look like if you, if you take that to zero in, in time, right? Something like this. And this is like the 20% of, so 16 is something like 20% of, of 80. Yes, so this is how we got this number. And so to uh, reaching the conclusion, our call to action right, is to, for, for, uh, for uh, commercial uh, companies in general, uh, coming from the commercial space, is to write because you can learn everything from, from uh, immediately, all at once. So it's, it's to experiment from a greenfield development situation. So if, if, you, if you have like a new product, a new idea, you can insert some of these elements. So the FMEA, which improves your design very early. Uh, your static code analysis, which helps you bug fix uh, very early, right before you even release it, before you even test it, can be. Um, and, and see if these uh, uh, results materialize. Uh, so, so far we've seen that it's qu done quite waterfall, so you have the intended function, then the design, that part is quite waterfall, or view model like. The implementation, uh, maybe can be done more agile as well, but that's, I leave it for future work. Uh, yeah, and so the lessons learned. Um, on, uh, on this side, I'll put the lessons learned, which are technical, so in blue, is that safety isn't that hard. It's not some kind of dragon in your closet that once you open it, oh, you, we have to run so many tests, we have to run vehicles. For, for software, uh, for, or, or for ASOS AB range, it's not, it's not that much. The extra work is right in the range of 20-25%. For the other ones, it ramps up to like 80% or even more. It can be harder to reach. Right? It's just higher quality, basically. Right, and it does need some initial investment. So, so this is really the hiccup that we're facing right now: is that uh, people have to have to learn safety, and you have to do the configuration management, and a lot of technical debt has to be solved both in terms of code and configuration management. But the advantages are numerous because you, you get to thrive in the automotive industry if you do your safety right. Uh, the customer is more satisfied because the system is higher quality. You avoid legal and financial uh, risk. Risk of redesign, which can be costly. You imagine you make an unsafe system, then the customer tells you, "Yeah, but we want it to be safety approved," and then you do the redesign at extra time, extra cost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can make a whole presentation just about the advantages. Uh, and safety improves design and implementation very early, right? In the design phase, when you do the FMEA, it forces you to well, forces. <laughs> 
bit of a strong word, but but it it, it yeah it encourages you to really look into the design and understand what's going on there, what can be improved, right? And then to also surround it with a helper a safety mechanism. Also for the static code analysis, you fix your code before you even run it. Uh, and now for the let's say more for the project management side, some some lessons which are <laughs> very obvious if you think about it in hindsight. But when you're when you're sort of like in the heat of the project, you can get over enthusiastic, especially if you're a gearhead. Uh, like me, and uh, yeah, you can get over enthusiastic about something. So, so f for if, if a plan A fails or takes too long, then you should have a plan B, C, D uh, ready, of course. And, and and so one option can you can be tempted to think that one option for for your exploration is very <laughs> is, is very uh, interesting and very useful. But you should somehow uh, devise so that you can you can fail faster or, or really find out if it's useful. Right, and, and then also explore the other options to, to really see, to, to maximize the, the usefulness of your exploration. Uh, yeah, and so pretty much what I said, fail fast when entering new territory because you want to exclude large chunks of territory before, uh, before you, right early on, so you, you zero in on, on, on the stuff that's most interesting and useful. And finally, make sure your work is, uh, is aligned with the goal, right, because you can, can go off into the woods, into the mountains, and not stay on the path. So very interrelated. But yeah, th this, this has been basically the, the main issue for me because I spent some time battling configuration management and it, it, just, it just taught me that, yeah, there's technical debt that has to be fixed, but otherwise, other than that, yeah. So that was my presentation. Thank you all for listening. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dan. So, questions? Don't be shy. Hi. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, I have one question. Uh, as uh, I'm in the back here. I see you're very hidden over there. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, I see you now. Thank you. So my question is, uh, considering the high safety measurements you have to take, uh, um, did you consider, I mean, how did you approach the implementation? Like, did you generate code from the system and, I mean, system tools, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. just plainly hard-coded things and then write mm -hmm. tests like that? Or yeah. did you take any other approach, like TDD or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 so, so your question, um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense and it's on target, so. Uh, typically, I, I imagine, right, if you, if you streamline something, you might uh, generate code from your model, and uh, then you might get very accurate code. Uh, yeah, for, for something like IBM Rhapsody or Enterprise Architect or whatever. Um, but yeah, in our case, so so I just um, I, I just prototyped it. So <laughs> the proof of concept uh, when I wrote the code for it, I just uh, started writing C++ code on my own laptop in in a Linux, and I did everything everything there basically by myself on my laptop. From scratch, so it was it wasn't generated, uh, but the idea behind this was that first we write uh, well not so great code, and then you put it for a static code analysis tool, and you get the bunch of issues that you get, and that's how we obtain those uh, those issues that you that you've seen there. So we can see what happens when you take some code, right? That's uh, that's uh, yeah, that's it's very susceptible to to getting issues from from such a scan. We, we wanted to to see many messages that that you can get when well, when you, when you scan your code. Yeah, okay. yeah I hope Thanks. that answers the question. Yeah. Thanks. Said. Said, sorry. Hi, well done, and congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, did you follow any uh, standards or you know regulation yeah. for yes, this safety? Yes, yes, yes. So, so, so the w when you saw all the boxes and arrows between them, like the the colorful stuff with the s safety mechanism and then, the, yeah, uh, that was from the ISO 26262 standard. It's not too hard to understand, uh, at least on a high level, because it goes in line with the, with this V model. Right, so, so there's a part that tar targets the requirements conceptual phase, and then a part that targets the design phase, and then a part that targets the software implementation phase. Uh, there's also a part for hardware and for the system overall, because typically hardware-software combination in automotive, but we focus just on the software side. Uh, so that's, that's the standard, but for the C++, you have, uh, for C++14, you have Autosar, but usually it's, uh, it's an organization called MISRA that uh, does uh, uh, safety and security I or at least safety rules for, for your C++ code. So that's, that's stuff you can check out. Yeah. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, the presentation was really nice. Thanks. And uh, I've got a question. So as far as I can see, the system is kind of still kind of learning at the moment. And uh, the results can be improved if it's trained further, right? So, so uh, c can you say about the system? What did you say about the system? Again? So, system is still learning from the data and around, you know, the surrounding and stuff. So, once it's trained enough, then it's going to be pr giving uh, better results, right? Ah, uh, you, you're you're talking about neural networks. Yeah. Yeah, we we didn't involve any neural networks here. Of course, you can uh, you can experiment with that for sure. To maybe you're you're thinking about vision processing to to detect objects and cars and all that. Yeah, we we didn't go that far. So, so it wasn't a neural network project. It was focused on understanding the safety process. But yeah, I mean, that's a good question, actually. Maybe I should have included it in the future work, because yeah. I, I don't know what the impact is of, of machine learning on, on your safety. Like, if your system becomes more accurate, maybe there should be an analysis done there as well. But I, I, don't, know, I don't really know how to link it with machine learning uh, or neural networks right now on the spot. Oh, OK. Yeah. That's pretty much all. Good insight, yeah. Yeah, good question. I think some ideas for the possible uh, Tom Tom final project. <laughs> Looking at the Tom Tom clients. Yeah, any other questions? I think then we can. Okay, before I thank the speaker again, I want to ask you again. <laughs> okay, that was quick. So thanks again, Tom. Dan. So now we welcome Janice Conquet. Uh, the presentation, the work has been done at uh, Canon uh, Printing. And uh, she has uh, used uh, model-driven engineering techniques uh, to um, automate and improve the ink handling process. And for us, for people like us, normal users of the printers, it looks very simple. But actually, she has worked on a complex uh, printing machine. So enjoy the talk. Yes, hello. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you, Yancha. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Shanice Conquet, and uh, today I will be presenting to you a little bit, uh, give you some insight into the last 10 months of my project. So first, I will give a brief introduction. Then I will um, continue with the context and problem statement, followed by the implementation. Then I will show you some results and finish off with the conclusion and future work. So. I did my project at Canon Production Printing. Canon Production Printing is a, a huge uh, company that produces uh, print engines. And uh, these print engines come in different shapes and sizes, as you can see in these pictures. Some of these um, print engines can be really, really big. Um, you can see uh, the people here. Um, see, like, very small people, and the print engines are very large. So. <laughs> It differs a lot. But um, at the core of these print engines, there are different functionalities. And one of these functionalities is the ink handling functionality. The ink handling functionality is uh, the process of getting the ink from the containers to the print head. So my assignment is then focused on modeling of the um, ink handling, so specifically the ink handling functional model of the ink handling. Um, this is a very uh, multidisciplinary process. So you can think that you have uh, different kind of experts, like uh, chemical engineers that are mostly um, thinking about what kind of composition the ink has. You have the mechanical engineers who are very um, interested in the um, different components that go into um, these uh, print engines. But of course, you have the software embedded engineers as well, who make the software for these print engines. And all of these, uh, these people need to, con uh, these experts need to communicate with each other. And they do this using these um, models. And the models are mostly used then to test their designs, but also to simulate um, how these uh, print engines will be work, um, working, specifically with the flow and the air pressure, ink flow and air pressure. So a little bit more insight into the model. So the model contains two parts, the topology and the behavior. 
Now, for my project, I specifically focused on the topology because this is the basic to start off. So once we have the topology, then we can expand it more into the behavior. The topology consists, as I've said, uh, components already, but also pipes that connect these components together. The components you can think of, for example, the print heads, the valves, uh, also things like a print unit. My goal here is to contribute to um, the digital twin fac um, for the ink handling functionality with uh, the help of models, specifically um, with the goal to hopefully improve the um, collaborations between the different experts that um, are needed to make uh, such a complex system. So, what is a digital twins? Now, digital twins consist of three parts. The first part is the physical part. Um, for this, you can think of the different print engines that I showed you at the beginning that uh, Canon uh, production printing has. You have the virtual parts. This has, uh, contains a domain analysis, some models, modeling tools, but also simulation and visualization tools that they use. And then you have, of course, the data and uh, information that connects uh, these two together. For my project, I specifically focused on the domain analysis and the modeling tools. From, but I've also used the simulation and visualization tool to, give, uh, to visual, uh, be able to visualize the results that I, I was able to get from my models that I made. Okay, so before I get into what exactly my project is and what I did, I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into how things are done at uh, Canon right now. You have the um, ink handling functional designers, or designers for short, and uh, they have a, an ink handling design drawing, like on paper, that they make. This uh, drawing they use to um, be able to explore the design of, this, of uh, the design space of ink handling functionality and also search for um, different optimal um, design um, for the ink handling. And then they do this by the means of simulation, specifically with the Simscape simulation. So Simscape is um, a framework um, in MATLAB that is specifically used for mechanical designs. I, sorry. <laughs> At the same time, the drawings are also given to embedded uh, software engineers. And for them, they are more interested into verification and testing of the behavior of the, sys the um, embedded system. And they do this using um, simulations in SIL. So SIL is a software in the loop uh, framework developed by Canon Production Printing that is specifically used in the um, visualization and simulation that I've spoken before in the, um, the digital twin part. So if you look at it a bit more concrete into more technology-wise, you have then the designers that have the, the ink handling drawings. They manually write models in a Simscape, and then they simulate it, um, these models with Simscape. This embedded software engineers, they, manu they get this uh, manually, manually drawn uh, drawing. They um, manually write it in Artist, which is a real-time UML um, framework used by the embedded software engineers to um, then uh, be able to use it for their simulations and their verifications. And then this Artist then generates C++ code which is then used to create, compile um, SIL plugins to then be used for in the SIL simulations. So as you saw, I said a lot of manually making, everything is done, or not everything, but a big uh, portion is done manually. And the problem with that is that manually adding changes to the model can um, end up having that, the effect that uh, the different models used by the embedded uh, software engineers, but also the um, designers themselves become out of sync. 
So I propose to have a new design phase where we, have, uh, we automate the link between the model and the simulation model. So with model, I mean the hand-drawn model that the, the, the designers have. Um, yeah, this, uh, this will use uh, one source of uh, information where oh, um, the designers are able to model their or um, design their ink handling model. Um, this can then generate the topology for the C++ code that can then be compiled to SIL plugin and then used for the SIL simulation. At the same time, it can also generate topology that can be used for the M script code, which is then used to create the Simscape uh, model. And then this model can then be, um, can then be simulated in uh, Simscape. Okay, so I showed you the idea behind this uh, one uh, source of information. Now I'm gonna show you um, the tool that I've uh, made. Um, in this tool, I'm, you're able to make an ink handling topology. In this ink handling topology, you can add uh, different kind of um, components, such as the print unit. At the same time, you can add uh, components within components, like uh, this print unit contains uh, three different uh, um, components, the inlet, print head, and an outlet. And these components are then uh, connected through pipes. As you can see here, each component contains uh, certain parameters that you can uh, adjust as, uh, as uh, the need arise, but also the pipes have um, parameters. For example, the pipe have uh, radius and length. So like this, uh, the designers are able to make, uh, like this, they're able to make uh, an ink handling topology. With this um, topology, they are able to um, generate the C++ code for the cell plugin. But for the Simscape, you, have, you need some additional um, information because the simulation for Simscape is not the same as the simulation for cell. So I've added a, an extension to this uh, tool where you are able to have a, a simulation specific parameters specifically for Simscape. Um, for example, here we have the density of the ink is then given and the viscosity of the ink. Um, you're add, you add the ink handling topology that you've already previously made to this um, simulation um, setup, and then uh, you say where you want to monitor. So for example, here we want to monitor this point right here after the pipe and before the print head, but also the point um, right after leaving the print head when it's entering the second pipe. And like this, you are able to then um, set up the sim Simscape um, simulation and generate the M script code that can then create the Simscape model. So after um, um, generating this code, I took this, co this code um, specifically for the cell one. I um, was able to create the SIL um, plugin, and then um, let it run in SIL and get the results from it. So from the first uh, three parts um, uh, is the results using the original files. The bottom three is the um, results using the generated files to make the SIL plugin. Um, as you can see, if you specifically look at, uh, if you compare the top and the bottom one, they don't really give the same results. This is uh, actually something that we can show, okay, it doesn't give the same result, but it does give an output, meaning that you can connect um, and make a, a cell plugin from the generated code. But uh, during the um, compiling into these uh, DLL files, something is going differently than how it's currently being done with artists which in result gives a different uh, output. So a suggestion for this uh, is to try to create a, 
a, an interface between the gen generated code and the SIL plug um, plugin to be able to um, deal with this uh, difference. On the other hand, I did the exact same thing for um, Simscape. Simscape um, also has three different uh, um, results. And in the first one, again, I checked the original output and uh, um, put it and compare it against the, um, generate the output using the generated files. As you can see, in this, uh, these outputs, they show that they have the exact same uh, results for, th for the first one. The second one also gives the same result. And the third one also gives the same result. So for the Simscape part, we were able to recreate um, the same simulation using our generated code. So um, I've given you a little bit of uh, how you can create this uh, in candling topology, how you can set up the Simscape uh, simulation. And I've also showed you a bit of uh, how uh, what results this give, um, given the um, simulations. So, as you, re as you recalled, I mentioned that, we ha that uh, I made one point, of, uh, one point of information where the designers can make this, uh, these uh, in-handling topologies, and then, the, and then uh, they're able to generate the code the different codes and uh, simulate it in their different uh, simulations. And the goal was to contribute to the digital twin for the ink handling functionality using these models. And um, of course, improve the, the design process on its way, specifically the communication between the different experts. So we were able to prove this. We did show the that there is uh, one point of interest where we can have the designers make their um, topology, and then this can then be generated to different code for the different experts. Um, this uh, also means that there is some, um, we are able to synchronize the different models with each other, specifically then the um, original hand-drawn model that uh, the designers had with the um, simulation models. Um, what we also showed, although I did not uh, really dive deep into it, is that we are able to map the different um, blocks for um, the different components to different sim Simscape blocks. Because, uh, for example, a print head, as it is in uh, my, um, in my top uh, topology design tool, it is uh, shown as one block. But in Simscape, this can be up to 20 different blocks. So we are able to map this to each other. And lastly, we are able to facilitate uh, the collaboration between experts using this one point of communication. Some uh, thing for future work. Uh, as I mentioned, the SIL did not give uh, the same results back. So it would be handy to have some uh, interface for the integration with SIL. At the same time, um, at the beginning, if you remember, I did mention that the model, it contains the topology, but also the behavior. So right now, I focused on the topology, but uh, the behavior can also, is also an important part of the um, whole model. So adding this behavior to the existing topology that we have will greatly improve um, the tool. Um, we can also add... Um, former analysis or checking to uh, rules to ensure consistency and connect with other models used in uh, Canon production printing. So that is it for my uh, presentation. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah. Thank you, Janice. Um, questions? We are still trying to process how come it takes so much technology just to print. But behind the, the, uh, the huge printers, we can see it's a huge, complex problem, right? So while you are thinking of um, questions, um, 
I have a question about the design. You have mentioned the future work is behavior. You focused on the topology, right? But I could imagine, as you, as you introduced in the beginning, there are so many different type of uh, products. So your tool would work for all of them, or is it for a specific product? So the idea is that the, pro the product is right now focused on the um, ink handling, but you can imagine that certain components can also be used in different parts of the printer. So, of course, the, the ideal would be that you can reuse these uh, components in other parts of uh, your system as well. Great, thank you. So, looking at the audience. Do I miss anybody? What mask? We have enough time. Uh, But then I have also another question. Okay. <laughs> so you haven't shared um, about your project management. So this mm -hmm. is a, a project with uh, model driven engineering aspect into it. Obviously, before the NGD program, you have done your also project graduation project for master studies at the same university on the model driven engineering, right? So what was the biggest uh, challenge for you to tackle in this, um, in terms of the uh, technical perspective, but also the uh, project management side? And that's of course. A lot of the junior trainees are here, so it's good to share your lesson. Okay, um, for the technology side, uh, my biggest uh, challenge was, of course, to fix uh, the difference that I had with the SIL. And I, it was a bit of uh, figuring out where exactly and why it wasn't really giving the same um, output as I expected. And uh, in the end, unfortunately, I wasn't able to pinpoint exactly where it was uh, going out going wrong. And uh, for project management, I think the biggest challenge was getting thrown into some unexpected situation and still managing the project at the same time. So, of course, uh, something, anything can happen when during 10 months, but you have to just keep focus and saying, okay, you know, it happens, you can't do much about it, but what you can do is uh, take the positive out of it and see how do you move forward from this and just uh, try not to panic. I think that's the best uh, advice I can give to the juniors as well. Thank you, Janice. So let's uh, thank the speaker. Yeah? Thank you. So our last but not least speaker is uh, Abel Fazel, for short we call Fazel. <laughs> Saravani will present his work at Thermo Fisher Scientific. It's very easy title, remote uh, uh, yeah, electronic microscope. So how to make it a remote? I think it was in your hands, so let's uh, see your results. Thank you so much. You can hear me, right? Okay. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Jianja mentioned, my name is Abel Fazel, but everybody calls me Fazel. Uh, during these two years. It was nice. I actually kind of liked it. Uh, I'm here today for you guys to present my project at Thermo Fisher Scientific. And uh, let's start. So for what you're going to see later on in the presentation, first I'm going to give you a small introduction, what Thermo Fisher is, what they do, and uh, introduce one of their main products. Then I'm going to uh, show a kind of really general view of the current system, of uh, how it uh, works with the microscope today at uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Then after that, we're going to see my system or something that we recommended for them. Then we will see an implementation of that system. And lastly, like everyone else, definitely talk a little bit about verification validation and definitely lessons learned. OK, so introduction. The first part is about the Thermo Fisher Scientific themselves. And the second part introduces one of their main product lines called electron microscopes. OK, so Thermo Fisher Scientific, first, uh, it was introduced in 2006 two of the biggest companies of the US, namely uh, Thermo Electron and Fisher Scientific, actually merged together in 2006, and they created the name Thermo Fisher Scientific for the first time. What they do is, if you go to their website, you will see they are the number one in supporting the science. That means they have regions, instruments, and consumables, and whatever you see inside the lab that scientists use, whether uh, you know, they're doctors or they want to invent a new material or they want to test something, they have, Thermo Fisher supports their material. Even if they don't, I'm sure somewhere along the line they absorbed another company that actually does. In terms of size, 
Uh, they're really gigantic and huge. Just in 2021, uh, 39.21 billion US dollars were, was their revenue. And in terms of people that are working there, uh, more than 130,000 people work at Thermo Fisher Scientific in different parts of the world. They also have, uh, uh, I think, two or three offices here in Eindhoven as well. They're really uh, huge buildings. Okay, one of their main products. So I mentioned they have, do produce a lot of things. They do have a lot of regions, instruments, and one of the, their, these big instruments is an electron microscope. What you see here on uh, this picture is actually Glacis microscope. It's a gigantic piece of machine. It's around two meters tall. Uh, it's a mid-range, actually, so they even have bigger ones. I think Respa, uh, when he had his presentation, he has a picture of a Titan Krios. That's even bigger than this. It's around three meters tall. And as far as I understand, they actually changed the rooms to uh, kind of elevate the roof a little bit higher so they can actually put the microscope inside that room. So what's the difference between an electron microscope and a normal one? In a normal microscope, you put the sample on a... Uh, sample sheet, you will use the light that we are using right now to see the sample inside. But with an electron microscope, things are different. As the name suggests, they actually shoot electrons to the sample that they want to see, and that's how they produce an image. That's why whenever you see an image of an electron microscope all the time, it's actually black and white. It's because of the uh, electrons taking the picture. So using electrons, because the particle of electron is really small, it's even smaller than a molecule, you can see pictures that are at least 250 times even to 1,000 times even more granular and more details than a normal microscope. So you can easily go to picometers or even nanometers to just see your samples. And one of the other things, one of the other technologies that they also use is something called the cryo-EM or a cryogenic electron microscopy. This actually allows people to create a 3D model of samples and cells and molecules. Like the pictures that you see from a COVID-19 virus during these days, they actually used these microscopes to create that image. That's actually the actual virus. That's how small and how powerful these microscopes are. In short, they are actually used for operations called ultrastructures, so you will not see it daily used in a lab to see a blood sample or something like that. No, definitely not. They, will, uh, they are usually used for much more uh, uh, intensive tasks. Okay. So there is a current system with these microscopes. First, I'm going to talk about them. There are some, from a technological standpoint, there are some challenges for those. Where I'm going to talk about those challenges as well. And uh, I'm going to define some goals based on those challenges, the goals that we had in mind before the start of this project. OK, so the current system. If you want to see a general view of how everything works, first of all, it's a microscope. It requires a lot of software to function, because it's basically just a gigantic piece of hard, uh, hardware. And if you want to use hardware, you have to use software. So they produced many different applications, as you can see on the right side. They have a lot of applications. All of these applications kind of either run the microscope or help it calibrate or whatever you can imagine. These applications, all of them, they do require direct connection to the uh, microscope itself. That's why there is a PC connected to the microscope, and they call it microscope PC. This microscope PC is responsible of running all these different applications. These, mainly they are written in Python, C++, C++ and C-sharp, and .NET. So one other thing that to see and to note here is that all these applications also, because they have to run on the microscope PC, they will also share the uh, hardware and resources on the microscope PC itself. And, okay, so there are some challenges with this uh, technology that we have. And one thing to also mention is that all these applications are actually desktop applications. So what are the challenges? First, as I mentioned, all of these applications run on the microscope PC, so they have to share the resources. So imagine if somebody makes a mistake, and their application takes too much CPU, and then all of a sudden uh, your system becomes unresponsive, and then all the other applications also go down, and then you cannot use the microscope anymore. That's one of the biggest issues. The other uh, challenge that we will face with this system right now is that we have a rule in software engineering, it's called do not repeat yourself. It means that if I implement a functionality, I want to reuse it later on. I don't want to keep re-implementing it. Right now, these challenges also exist because these applications that I mentioned, they do use different technologies, but in many cases, they're actually doing the same thing. So they're all doing operation A, but in different languages. It was designed that way because, because of the needs of the customer and the current system, but maybe we can change that. The other challenge is updates. So as you can imagine, if you have 100 teams working on different softwares, and if you want to add one new feature to all of these softwares at the same time, what's going to happen? You have a lot of people, they have to work together. 
they have to implement that new feature, they have to communicate with each other, they have to test it, just make sure the, they don't actually this, uh, set the microscope PC on fire. And then when everybody is ready and everything is tested, then you can introduce the new feature to your customers. That's, that takes a long time. It's really costly in terms of money, in terms of time, in terms of manpower. It's something maybe you want to kind of mitigate. And the other problem is, not a problem per se, but if you want to have a web extension based on the current software, you can't actually do it. So if you want to go home and use your uh, mobile phone or your tablet or your even laptop from a distance, maybe connect to the microscope and see what's happening, you can't really do that based on the current system. OK, so let's define some goals. What happens? If we first, de if whatever we want to design, we want it to be client agnostic. Client agnostic means if I create a server, for example, and then you, any other applications in any other company wants to use the services of my server, I don't really care what kind of technology you use. I will develop my own server in C Sharp, and then you have another company entirely working with Python, that's absolutely fine, they can use my services. You have another company entirely using Java, they can still use the same thing. So I want my design to be client agnostic. Second, I want to kind of help and reduce these team dependencies that I just mentioned. So if you have all these teams working all the, all the time together, just to add a new feature, I want to reduce that because it's costly. The other goal is, and maybe the one that I mentioned we do on PC, is decoupling software and hardware together. So I want to take out all these applications running on the microscope PC and run them somewhere else because I don't want them to be bound by the hardware of the microscope PC. And the next goal is enhancing simulation and also testability. As you all imagine, when you create software for a piece of hardware, you have to test it at some point. And what happens if I create uh, some, sort of, some part of a testing in one code base in one place, so everyone else can reuse that instead of re-implementing their test all everybody by themselves? That's another point that we can uh, kind of consider as one of the main goals. And the most important one, we want to be able to remotely monitor and control the microscope now. We just don't want to be bound by the microscope PC. So for example, currently, if you want to take a sample, you, you will put your sample inside the microscope. You have to go and sit behind the microscope PC, log in, and then use the system so you can actually acquire an image and see your sample. We, don't want, we want to be able, now we want you guys, or the customers in, in the long run maybe, to be able to do the same thing, but maybe sitting at home. I think one of the biggest uh, like reasons that this was actually happened is because of COVID. We all went home and started working remotely. It would also be good to you know, remotely uh, control your microscope. OK, so our system. Uh, first, I introduced the remote layer as, my own, uh, as some sort of a suggestion that we want to use. Then for the implementation of the remote layer, I'm going to uh, present to you guys a comparison between the two things that uh, my stakeholders asked me to look into, and we did it all together. And then finally, the choice that we used for the implementation, the uh, gRPC. OK, the remote layer. So if you take a look at back at the picture that you just saw, you saw that all these applications, they were running on the microscope PC. So if, one, if I want to, uh, in a general view, show what we have in mind as a system, is that, OK, I want to have all these applications outside the microscope PC. And then if they require connection to this microscope PC, I want them to connect to an interface or an API, which is in turn running on the microscope PC and connected to the microscope PC by itself. So the first thing that we see is the barrier of the hardware is now broken. You can run this application one in your own server at your home or any other server that you want in your cloud, maybe. And if it even goes down, you know, it breaks down, nothing will happen. Uh, your microscope will be untouched. The other part is, if this interface and API is client agnostic, means it can easily service any other application in any other technology. So if application one is Python, that's OK. I can service that. If the application is .NET, I can still service that, or any other uh, technology for that matter. The other part is, if we only have one place here, to focus, this means that we will have one code base. If you only have one code base, it means that I now I can have one team working on that one code base. Then you, you're not going to have that much team dependency to each other. So you're not going to have 10, teams working together just to add a new feature. You don't have to do that anymore. Now you can just focus on one team here, and if you do add a new feature, they can just tell anyone else. The same thing goes for testing. So if you, for example, imagine these microscopes have many, many cameras. They're different type of cameras. You add a new camera to this microscope and tell other people, OK, we added this new shiny camera to the microscope. Now we want to use it. And we also uh, made it possible for you guys to just connect to this uh, new camera via this interface. So there's only one place for this new change for this new feature. And we're going to add it, and everyone else can use that feature or even test it. 
And the other part is, for example, we can have a web server here or a mobile application here, and they can connect to the microscope remotely. Maybe you want to monitor that. You want to know the column pressure of your microscope. You want to know whether it's sleeping, whether it's ready or not, or you know, what's happening. So these are all made possible. So I talked about the remote layer and the remote interface. So how are we going to implement the, that remote interface? The first choice is REST. It's something that everybody uses these days. If you see web applications, most of them are, used, uh, are using REST right now. So REST by itself is not, is not a framework that uh, you, you, know, you can use. It actually uh, stands for representational state transfer. It's some so, sort of an architecture that you can use based on implementation. Of course, if you want to make that ar architecture a reality, there are many frameworks for you. For example, in C-Shop, you have .NET Framework and .NET Core. You can use them and implement the RESTful applications. What REST does in turn is just, it's ba basically it's just the verbs and standards that it, you can use to produce a RESTful application. That's it. It's nothing really f uh, fancy for that matter. Uh, REST, as I mentioned in one of our goals, we wanted to client agnostic interface, right? So REST is also client agnostic. It means that you can have a server written in .NET Framework, and you can have many other clients in Java using your services every day without any problem. The other part uh, about the REST is that if you want to send messages, inside the body of your messages is actually a wildcard. There is not no standards for you. You can use JSON if you want. You can use something else if you want. You can send Base64 inside it if you want. So it's all up to you what you want to use. And one important uh, thing about REST is it only uses unary messages. So just consider a cycle. You send a request, and then you receive a response. That's it. It will be done. It's called a unary message or one message that you can use. The other counterpart that we also looked at is called GRPC, or Google Remote Procedure Call. It's actually a framework developed by Google itself. I think it's around 10, 15 years old, maybe. Uh, this framework is, again, client agnostic. So if you do create a server using GRPC, you can service other customers using any technology that they want. The Good thing about gRPC is that there is a message format standard that you can use. So gRPC, as we will see later on, uses a standard message format. You can use that standard message and then send your message forward. You, you don't have to send whatever you want. You know? you, you're not bound. Uh, not, it's not a limitation, per se, but it actually gives more uh, standard to the way that you send messages. And the other part is for gRPC, you have unary and streaming messages. So gRPC, in terms of type of message you can use, is really versatile. You can just use unary messages. You can stream from server to client, even from the client to server. You can keep it bidirectional the way that you want. So it is a little bit, uh, not a little bit, actually much more uh, versatile in terms of type of messages that you can use. OK, so if I want to give you a more detailed comparison of these two, so for example, let's talk about performance. gRPC is written right now based on HTTP2. And REST is a little bit older. It's using HTTP1. And as we all know, for a newer version of most things, they are actually faster. You, HTTP2 is, in terms of performance, in terms of if you want to send data, it works faster than HTTP1. And in terms of industry, which industries are actually supporting these applications, gRPC is supported by Google, as I mentioned. And in our case, in the case that I used, it was C-Sharp and .NET. So I can assume that the REST implementation will be supported by Microsoft. You can to some extent, trust these companies that they will support their software good, they will update it, you know, uh, keep it out of trouble, and maybe patch security uh, issues and so, forth, so on and so forth. In terms of software support, both of these applications support, in, in my case, it was really important that these applications support c -sharp and .NET, because again, I was using these applications. Both of them support uh, c -sharp and .NET. In terms of decoupling development that I mentioned that was really important for us for it to be client agnostic, both of them are client agnostic, so we can use it. But as we will see later on, or maybe based on experience, the gRPC is actually easier to be client agnostic than REST. I can also give examples later on, but if you want to. Uh, in terms of backward compatibility, so it, you all know if you add a new feature, maybe you have a client that is running the old version, you might break their code, right? That's something that happens every day. For, for gRPC, things are actually a little bit different. There are some rules for you to follow. And if you follow those rules while adding your new feature, while adding your new data to your message format, if you do follow your rules, you will be backward compatible. There are even rules for forward compatibility. That actually happens automatically. So, and there are just written rules that you can follow. For REST, uh, there aren't any written stone rules you can use. Obviously, uh, there are many ways you can uh, mitigate an issue like that. But it's not directly supported, or it's not something that is supported actually by the company themselves. In this case, Google actually does that. 
In terms of scalability, both of them are scalable. You can have load balancers. You can you know, have different servers, different places. That's all well and good. In terms of security, both of them provide security. Of course, REST has more mature maybe security in terms of because there are, has been a many, many years now that people are actually using REST. And in terms of testability, there are uh, frameworks out there. You can test them, uh, create stops, whatever you want. In terms of browser support, meaning that you can open a gRPC request in a browser. In REST, obviously, yes. You've, you've seen it every day. But for gRPC, I put no there. And the reason is gRPC web uh, package that we have currently, maybe it's not functioning as it should be. They're working on it, obviously. But I just flat out said no, because it's actually hard to work with at its current state. But for the next part is streaming support. One of the most important uh, aspects that we do require for a framework at Thermo Fisher, especially for a microscope, is streaming support because it's a microscope. The one thing that you want it to do for you is to produce images. You want it to acquire an image, you want to see your samples. So it has to stream, and the size of the images are really, really gigantic. So if you want to do continuous image acquisition, it's around 30 gigabytes of data that you're going to get in a few, uh, like in a, maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you've chosen. So the streaming support is one of the biggest uh, aspects that we do require, which is supported by gRPC, and because it's based on HTTP2, it's actually even faster. But REST does not even support that. And in terms of program language dependence, meaning that using the application actually depends on the programming language, for gRPC, it is a no. And for REST, it's a yes. So what does it mean? If I create a REST server, and you want to use that REST server, you have to use one of the REST clients that is available for you. There are many, for example, for C Sharp, for Java, there are many applications, many implementations. You just download them, one of the libraries, and you use them yourself. Those implementations, they might be different. They are based on a standard, but they are different. So it depends on the client that you're using. But for REST, actually, the clients are produced for you, automatically generated for you. So you don't even have to create them or import them from somewhere else. And because the generation is automatically done by gRPC, it actually doesn't really matter on what programming language that you use. We will see later on how gRPC works, but it's, in my opinion, one of the magics of having a, a standard. So the uh, heart goes to gRPC here. Uh, for our needs and based on the uh, comparisons that we did, we even did some test implementations, we decided to continue this project for gRPC. So from now on when I say, okay, I, we do have a remote layer, we remote your remote server, I do actually mean a remote gRPC server or a remote gRPC client and so on and so forth. Okay, how gRPC works. So I mentioned it, uh, generate, it kind of generates code for you, it generates the client for you. So how does it actually work? So gRPC works based on a file called a protobuf file. This protobuf file, it's uh, just a file that protobuf. There is a standard that you can use inside this file. You can write things inside. This standard is called protobuf3 right now. There is a version 2 as well that you can use. What this standard does for you, it lets you define data types for yourself. It lets you uh, define services for yourself. It lets you define, OK, what, if I define a service, I want to also define what kind of input and output that service provides. So what you need to give it as an input and what you can expect as an output from that service. You can define all this based on this standard inside the protobuf file. And the other best part for it is it provides conversion for you. So for REST, as I mentioned, you can use a JSON converter for yourself or any other things. But you've got to use something. With gRPC, it actually does it for you. And the other best part for gRPC is that it will create and generate code for you. You don't have to do anything in terms of uh, like writing the client or anything similar to that. So how does that actually work? So if you see here, first, if you create a protobuf file, so you go inside the protobuf file, you create one, you say, OK, I have a service. I want to call it service A. It has an input called input and output called output. You define those, and then you also define what kind of data you have inside input or output. That's it. But the first step, you will do that. Second, it does not matter what programming language that you use. You just have to download a Proto-C or a Proto-Buff compiler for that language. You will first compile this Proto-Buff file, and then you, uh, the compilation process generates code for you based on what you've defined. What are these codes? So first, if you have a service A that you define inside the Proto-Buff file, and then you generate code, the first thing that it does for you is service discovery. It means that if you create a service, it will let other people uh, know what kind of uh, like in function or operation your service actually supports. So if I do have a REST server, I have to give you some sort of a document to tell you, OK, if you go to this pass, this is a post request. You, you have to send me this amount of data, and I will send you this. I have to give these informations to you. 
But for, for gRPC, it's actually kind of different because these classes will be generated automatically so the other person actually using them can see what kind of uh, you know, uh, operations that you do support. This serialization and deserialization of these messages are done by gRPC itself. You don't have to do anything as well. The clients. So if you do create one of these protobuf files and define your service, other people that want to use this service can also uh, compile your protobuf file. And then for each of those service classes, you will have a client. They can just create a new instance of that client. And also, they also need to know the address of your server. They will connect to your server and then use the service. And the other uh, last part is the, a few abstract classes in terms of services. So I don't know if you've, uh, like obviously many of you have not done development server side, but when you do create an application on the server side, you have something called logic. So you have to define the logic. What happens if somebody send requests to me? How am I going to answer the request back? So gRPC gives you a few classes. These are abstract, obviously, because gRPC doesn't know your logic. You can just go ahead, implement those abstract classes, and suddenly you will have a logic behind the name. Uh, in terms of how this process works, as I mentioned, these uh, code generations that you will see here, they're agnostic. So imagine that I create my own server, I will have a protobuf file, and I have 10 clients. I will just give these clients my protobuf files, tell them, okay, these protobuf files will help you compile them once, and then for each service that I provide, you're going to have a client, you can easily call that client. For inputs and outputs of those files, uh, of those services, you can again have the classes by itself. You don't have to create them yourself. Just use them. Literally just use them. One thing that I did during this project was actually for testing and a demo. So everything, as I mentioned, was written in C-sharp and .NET. And I just created a client for myself in Java in one hour using the same protobuf files and I connected to the microscope. I just wanted to see how long it takes actually to introduce a new client to the whole, to the whole uh, in, uh, system. Okay. So I talked really about your PC client and a server. I'm going to show you a really simple flow of how a server and a client works, then talk a little bit about the gRPC server itself, and finally, uh, the gRPC client. So the flow, how it works. In terms of, uh, it's the same picture as before, but I just wanted to mention how, like, where this gRPC server and actually client rest. So for the first part, the gRPC server resides on the microscope PC. It will import the interfaces required to connect to the microscope and use the microscope. You just put them inside microscope PC. You, you will then run this uh, gRPC uh, server. What it does is that, when, as I mentioned, you obviously have clients and you will give them protobuf files. There are many other uh, applications, one through N that I showed before. These are microscope, instrument, microscope softwares. All of these softwares can carry these uh, client by themselves. And then instead of just connecting to the microscope directly, they just say, OK, for example, I want to do operation A. They just tell the client, client sends a request to the server, and the server does the operation A with the microscope. This operation can be, for example, acquiring an image for you to see your samples. You see, okay, I want to see my sample. You will send this request via the server. The server just gets this uh, image of the sample from the microscope, packs it really nicely and beautiful, and then send it to the client. And then the client can show it to whatever microscope software it actually did the request in the first place. So what happens here is literally just gRPC server is sitting here, is just exposing the services of this microscope to anyone outside, anyone with the, server, with the access, with the client uh, inside. So the server by itself, it's a little bit technical, but it's not that uh, really hard to see. The gRPC server is just an aggregation of a few services. So imagine 10, 20, 100, 150 services running inside that uh, gRPC server. And the only thing that it does is that when you receive a request, it will route the, get the request, it will route it to the uh, proper or maybe I, I would say right part of the microscope that can handle that request. It will pro provide the input, get the output, and then send it back. Uh, so every service, for example, service A here that implements the interface of iService, has an access to microscope in interfaces called, in here I'm going to call them microscope instruments which in turn means that you can literally imagine this as the microscope itself. So it, it's just a bridge of the communication. This service, if you wants to do any operations, for example, operation A here, it can do the operation via these microscope instruments. All of these services here that other people will you know, kind of call in some point or another, they were all defined in protobuf files, and obviously the server will provide the implementation and the logic behind the protobuf files. That's it. That's the, in, in a simple view, that's the all, only job that the gRPC server actually does. The same thing for the client. 
So as I first mentioned is that in, uh, in REST you will have one client and then you can send requests to many, many parts of one server. VGRPC, the clients, as I mentioned, are generated for you, so you will not create them. You, you, you have the class ready. You can create a new instance for yourself and then use the client. Uh, one thing to mention is that for each of those services that you define, you will get a client. It might be a little bit uh, like weird because it's different than REST. You will have one client and then connect to different parts. But in here, you have, if you have 100 services, you will have 100 clients. In, in a forum, it's actually a good thing because then people know which client to use when they want to use whatever service that you want. So what I did was I did have a, I did create a, uh, like a client, uh, sort of a, a general client that everybody can use, and then packed, uh, aggregated all the clients for my services inside. And this client actually knows, for example, if you call operation A on it, which client to call for, to answer the operation A. And the other thing to mention is that these clients can use a channel to your server to send and receive data. The good thing about this on the gRPC side is that you will create it just one channel. You keep this channel in entire your project, and then you can reuse it. It's thread safe. It's type safe. It's uh, like you, you're not, you, you don't really have to worry about what's going to happen with the channel. You just correct it. You have the server address. You connect to the server, and then yeah, just pass around the channel, and everybody can use it to connect to your services. Great. So a few final words. First, the verification and validation of the whole project, and maybe some of the lessons that I've learned so far. So first, verification and validation. Uh, we all know the first thing that you do when you write code is unit testing. You unit test your code based on uh, what, what you believe is right. You test the code, make sure, OK, it passes. It, it does what I want, to, want it to in the really granular level. The other thing that I did in terms of testing was integration testing using an online microscope. What is an online microscope? So as you saw in the picture, the glacius microscope, it's really hard to actually test one. Because first of all, it's gigantic. Not everybody, any time they want, they can just walk into a room and then sit behind the microscope and test their code. That's not possible. For that matter, Thermo Fisher created a simulation of a microscope inside a virtual machine that you can run on your laptop. This simulation is so extensive, you can change anything that you want inside. You can change the pressure of the microscope. You can change the temperature of the room inside. And it will react accordingly based on your changes. And you can connect to that simulation of the microscope. You can use it and test your code. For the first step, that's actually what I used to integrate test my entire code. Just imagine like I create a new feature. I unit test it. Everything works fine. OK, fantastic and great. And then I have to compile everything, put it in one project, and then test it against the simulation of the microscope running inside the VM. Uh, it's a little bit actually hard to work with because you have to run this simulation, you have to configure it, you have to make sure everything works fine, and then connect to it, and then see if the behavior is actually what you expect. As for the validation, just to make sure, OK, for this part, you have to make sure that your stakeholders are actually, their requirements are being met. So what I did is that every two weeks we had demos. So without any miss, every two weeks, maybe like one day we would move it. But without any miss, we would actually have demos and explain, OK, what I've done so far. And I would actively show them, uh, whether via video or just live, show people, OK, how this feature works, how it can connect to the microscope, and in terms of value, what it has for us. And we also, uh, there is a software called EPU inside the uh, Term Official Scientific. I did test runs with that EPU. And people that you know, kind of use it uh, as developers daily just to make sure, OK, the behavior is, again, what they expect. So they would, sometimes they would actually use the EPU and they would ask me, OK, is it the real microscope? Is it the VM? Or is it your gRPC client implementation? And they couldn't even tell. That's actually one of the goals. So for the lessons learned, uh, first of all, uh, be specific. So when, especially because we, we are all talking right now, I'm pretty sure like for maybe like 1% of these people here sitting, the English is their first language. So when you want to talk to somebody, maybe the words interpreted in different ways. So try to be as specific as possible when you're talking with your stakeholders. So if you do set a meeting for the next week and say, OK, this is stand-up or this is planning, actually put something in the agenda. What do you want to plan in that meeting for the next week? To actually give people some idea what's happening, what's not happening, what, what that meeting is about. And when you're done with that meeting, create a summary for that meeting. What happened? Because we are humans. We have memory. We, we forget things. When you forget, OK, like two months ago, we, we had this thing that we talked about, and then we, we got into a conclusion, right? What was the conclusion? How can you now make a decision based on those information if you don't have them? And for the issues, if you create a backlog, especially if you do work agile, you want to create issues. Whatever you want to do, create an issue for it. If you want to write a document for TUE, create an issue for one. Because if you don't, then first people would think, OK, you didn't do anything. 
And second, they were going to ask, okay, yesterday, what did you do? Where were you? What, why did you not implement this? And why did you not do that? Keep these as clean as possible at the same time. Like, don't have just one issue working on it and then let it go and then go jump onto another issue. Don't really do that. Keep everything clean, make sure everything is there, just for yourself and for your own safety. <laughs> and for the documentation parts. So a lot of people start working, they just you know, keep working, keep coding, do some testing and everything, but we all start on documentation really late in our projects. I know I've done it for, uh, for some parts. And what happens is that when, if, you do, if you do not write documentations the moments that you write them, maybe two months into the project, you want to know why you made one decision, this is specific decision A, and you can't really link it to anything. So if, because you haven't written anything. For example, what I did was, if I did a discovery, or if I did, thought something was good, I would write a Confluence page on it, explaining why I chose this, what, like the test code in it, even like I would attach the test code inside, I would attach the screenshots, maybe sometimes video, just for the next time, even for myself, to come in here and say, okay, if we, I did decision A, why did I do it, when did I do it, and what was the reasoning behind it? So definitely keep decision inside, and also the same thing goes for your ideas, because especially throughout these projects, maybe your project is really exploratory, you have different ideas going on around, write them down, make sure they are somewhere safe that you can easily uh, later on come and visit, just to make sure, okay, did I, uh, like I test idea A, it did not work, why did it not work, and why you want to move to idea B, and so on and so forth. And definitely it's really usable because later on you can use that for your final report, and then you don't have to write everything from scratch. They're just sitting on the computer writing all day. Okay. Uh, that's my entire presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fazl. Very insightful lessons learned. So, are there any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Fazl. It's a nice presentation and good insights, yeah, definitely. Uh, my question is, uh, did you consider a concurrent request from uh, different clients in your server side? Uh, I did that, and it was actually one of the features that we wanted to explore. Uh, we did even some implementations for it, some designs as well, but it did not go 100% and all the way through. So that's why actually it's not even here, even on my final report, but there are some codes that we implemented for it. So the thing is, the uh, microscope server, the one that is you know, behind and responsible for connecting to the microscope, kind of handles simulation to some extent. What we did create a layer to actually uh, prevent you know, concurrent access to it, maybe like lock the clients and UI, something like that. We did do it, but uh, in terms of details, no. I did a simple Im implementation, but there is also some ideas for event-driven implementations as well. If you want to acquire an image, send the event and make sure like, nobody's using it. But yeah, that, that's definitely part of it that, and something that they are going to consider uh, soon in the future. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, what I have a question that is, uh, did you consider security in gRPC? Like, let's say the clients are available, and let's say I have the interface, I can easily implement all the functionalities I need, and in that case, how do you implement the securities? Like, let's say, prevent remote access from unwanted clients. Okay, actually, the security was not part of the project. Uh, we, I, we, what thing, what we, in terms of decision making and architectural decision, obviously, if you want to make a decision, you want to be sure, okay, in the near future, I need security. So whatever implementation that I'm experimenting with right now should have that. But in terms of actually implementing that security and using it, it wasn't uh, part of my project. So no, actually, I did not consider that. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Uh, regarding what you explained, uh, the interface, I think in case of uh, using the hardware resources, of course, when you use the interface, is less. But what about uh, the single point of failure? Because what I was seeing also, again, this interface is a single point of failure. So if it goes down, uh, did you think of something like, I don't know, some backups or something that can, if that one go down, then it can be also? OK, that's actually a nice question. So Definitely, it is a single point of failure. Uh, but the thing is, now if it works remotely, in a, ter in a sense that you can have multiple instances of that. Obviously, if the microscope PC goes down, yeah, you cannot use the microscope anymore. But if that instance goes down, you can have another one working in terms of a backup or even some sort of a load balancer inside. That's why actually we do, if you do have desktop applications, you can't really do that. Like, 
ask one desktop, okay, if you crash, I'm going to use another desktop application in between. Uh, but yeah, you are right. There is still like uh, works, but even in the end, like, no matter what you do, especially because they want to have one single actually one single place to work. So they want to have one place that you can use to connect to the microscope for whatever whoever is outside. And the reason with all the benefits and you know the pain that you already have, they already have to go through to update the code, their code. But indeed, it is a like MP microscope PC is actually by itself is a limitation because. It's there, it's one PC. If it goes down, just like you mentioned, then everything goes down. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. Thank I you. have a question about your server side implementation. So you showed that you have one gRPC server which um, includes one service, but uh, have you considered about implementing more services towards microservice architecture uh, in, in which uh, those services are running in a separate process? Uh, in a separate process. First of all, actually, the server actually has a list of services, so it's not just one. Uh, it has in implementation that I have around 20, 20, 25, because I didn't actually implement everything for the microscope, but a handful of uh, services. In terms of running them in a mul uh, multiple uh, instances, you can actually do that. That's also possible. But uh, there was no reason for us to do it, actually. Because the one, thing to, uh, one good thing to have every service inside and running for, for one instance, the one thing good thing is that, for example, if one service is using part of the microscope, and that's in turn busy, you cannot use it anymore, it's much easier to tell other services that, OK, I'm using the, this camera right now. Please do not bother me until I'm finished. But if it's running in another service, then you can see how it can complicate things. So in terms of why we didn't do it, we just we didn't need, see the need to, you know, to make things more overcomplicated. Because for the, uh, just remember, this whole project was actually a technological kind of insight. Okay, if you want to do it, do this gRPC or maybe remote layer, how would it go in terms of a current system, in terms of current code? So maybe that's something we can explore, but right now I don't actually know why we, we need to do something like that. But maybe it can be uh, maybe if the uh, these services maybe they go really really complicated in the end, and then we decide that yeah they're really complicated. Maybe it's a good thing to separate them, or if they work with different parts of the microscope and they never overlap, we can also do that. Okay, thank you. And my second question is that. Um, did I understood correctly that uh, your test setup was using some remote connections from your own laptop or something like that instead of the microscope PC? Yeah, so uh, for the testing, especially for the integration part, mm -hmm. uh, I did test obviously with the real microscope as well. So I did reserve time and go uh, use a microscope PC to see my code is working right now. But at Thermo Fisher, to facilitate testing and simulation faster, they created a, some sort of virtual machines that you can use. So imagine you can run a virtual machine on your own laptop, and that virtual machine contains a server called Microscope Server. There are different versions for them, for the Glacius, for Titan Krios, for each one you have one. You can run that simulation and test your code against that, because that's the fastest. If you see the table of reservation to just get maybe half an hour with the microscope, it's gigantic, and a lot of people just want to use it uh, to, to finalize their t uh, test codes. So the first step and easier, easiest one was actually the online testing that we did with the virtual machine. But yeah, it's, it was a simulation literally running in my own laptop. But as I mentioned, the simulation is really, really extensive. There are a lot of thoughts inside. It's something that if, if you went the first time that you use it, in my, I didn't actually believe it because any, you can even put samples inside, imaginary samples. You can take them out. You can do whatever you want in a real microscope. And the simulation is so good, and pe people inside Thermo Fisher trust it uh, uh, a lot. And a lot of people say, OK, if you test your code with a simulation, and if it works, there is a 99.99 .99 chance that it will work with a real microscope as well. That's how big the stimulation is. I don't know how, how to you know, convey this like, sort of yeah. a... Sorry, uh, maybe I didn't make my uh, question clear enough. Uh, did you test it between two separate devices, different devices? So your laptop running the simulation on uh, one device, and you try to connect remotely from another device? Oh, Have yeah, you... definitely. Okay. We also did that. Like, uh, for that one, we actually made a demo video, but because I do show a lot of... Uh, maybe inside work of the system. I decided not to show the video here now, but the, uh, we absolutely did that. We did that one, one thing that we wanted to do, I also did it at home. So I went home, connected to Thermo Fisher Network, and tried the same thing with the microscope that I reserved. We just wanted to see, we also did it with the tablet, the same thing. 
and my own laptop, obviously, and other systems too, just to make sure that, okay, it's actually running remotely. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. So here comes the final stage, so right before the ceremony. I think uh, on the screen you can see not only today's eight speakers, but the other speakers as well. And we also want to thank the companies for allowing our trainees to share their results because most of our projects are highly confidential and in some cases even involved in final or future products of a client. So are very extremely client, uh, grateful to the clients. And uh, you're going to see all the remaining trainees in person in uh, one, actually in half an hour. And I want to say actually, before I thank these people, I want to thank all of you for joining the symposium today, uh, making the time to attend not only juniors, because we said you must. <laughs> I think that's obvious, but I mean, some of you also from the junior, junior, real 2022 generation came, I mean, on your own wish. So it's very nice to see you. And also, we are certain that you have learned a lot from this uh, generation. And we are very grateful to the company supervisors and also the TU supervisors who are in attendance. You uh, make um, not only our lives very easy by giving an uh, exciting project to our trainees, meaning that they can get occupied to solve complex problems in such a short time with your support. And uh, we are truly grateful to all the company um, supervisors and to you supervisors as well. And uh, our case, you know, there is a saying that it takes a village to raise a child, but uh, we feel the same. It takes a village, maybe even as a town, a lot of people to train one trainee. Uh, that's why probably there are not that many uh, NGD programs like us in the world. Um, and we are very proud of the team behind the scene. Um, that is the uh, management, uh, Mark Dizre, and of course uh, me, and also Harold is in attendance, right, who was managing, and in fact, others also had joined, my uh, predecessor who has joined me, and uh, our advisory board, so there are a set of people from the industry, uh, the leaders, the advisors in terms of state of the art and also shaping the program, and we have also education board and all kind of institutes within the TUE, making sure everything goes good, and also our colleagues from uh, NGD, uh, Automotive and Mechatronic System Design, especially Rizke and Ellen. We have a very collaborative, good session with a uh, multidisciplinary aspect uh, with our trainees. And obviously, as I mentioned, again, partner companies, especially for this uh, generation. And um, you get the best results because you are the best supervisors. And I want to thank again and emphasize again your guidance, supervision, and inspiration uh, uh, for all this period. And also, of course, uh, the TU supervisors making sure things go quite good. So our trainees learn from the best. Uh, that's why um, we exist. And uh, the, uh, the last I have put also the list of companies that have done the, gr uh, the group projects on Era Health, Silicon Valley based uh, project with R&D department in Eindhoven. They have done project with us for the first time for designing and developing a tool uh, for the cloud-based systems and tough trucks, fruit masters. So our trainees also during the first 14 part, this generation has also designed robotic systems to automatically sort fruits. Um, and uh, also Airbus and European Space Agency, I think if they could afford, they would be happy to have their final graduation projects, but obviously it's an expensive one. But anyway, so this is just a few people and companies and organizations we want to thank. And uh, the last part uh, is the program this afternoon. Uh, the, the rest is uh, Mark is going to chair. It was my pleasure to chair the morning session, Expo Symposium uh, for me. So afternoon will be chaired by the scientific director, Mark van der Brand. So we're going to have um, until three o'clock coffee break in the same place. And then we start with the uh, welcome speech and diploma ceremony. And afterwards we'll conclude with a reception in the same place. So enjoy.
Please be seated. Welcome to this uh, award ceremony. Let me first introduce myself. I'm Mark van der Brand. I'm Professor of Software Engineering and uh, Software Engineering and Technology, the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science of the Eindhoven University of Technology. And I'm also scientific director of the Software Technology Program. And in that role, I'm honored to hand over later the diplomas. So first of all, I would like to welcome all of you, graduates of the engineering doctorate from the program Software Technology. Also, I would like to welcome family, friends, colleagues, and supervisors to this NG Diploma Award Ceremony of the Eindhoven University of Technology, or abbreviated as the TUE. Today, we are proud to award 12 trainees from this technological designer program their NGD Diploma Engineering Doctorate. Currently, there are technological designers or NG programs at the TUE, at Delft University of Technology, and Twente University, and at Wageningen University. The NGD programs have been around for 35 years, and today TU Delft, University Twente, and the TUE have already trained more than 4,500 technological designers. The NGD programs have been created in close collaboration with industry. They responded and respond to the current needs of the high-tech sector. We train best and young engineers. The selection of the trainees is tough. An important task for these engineers is innovation or knowledge valorization. How, be, how to best transfer knowledge into value. While pure researchers are driven by curiosity and want to understand or predict phenomena, the real engineer wants to create value by means of the creation of new and innovative artifacts. That is exactly what the technological designers programs are about, and what our today's new NG graduates have accomplished during their two-year program in industry. As of today, they may use the degree of engineering doctorate, or NGD. The NGD degree gives these designers an important advantage in industry the extra knowledge and experience these NG candidates have acquired usually can only be gained after a number of years working in, industry, in a company. We wish our new graduates a lot of success in their future career. I also want to provide a special thank you a special thank you to all to our partners in high-tech industry. The second year design project conducted by our NG trainees are proposed by the high-tech industry, and it is the industry urgent need for innovation and design engineers who are not afraid to go beyond the boundaries of disciplines that provide, that provide our NG trainees the opportunity to learn and earn during these challenging second year design projects. These design projects are great examples of the cooperation between the university research groups and the high-tech industry. We therefore also want to express our sincere gratitude to the TUE supervisors that offered support and guidance to the trainees during their project. Before the ceremony begins, first a brief explanation on the protocol. First, the supervisor from the university or industry will provide a short introduction on the graduate, an abstract of their thesis, and will then hand over the diploma. Additionally, the graduate receives an alumni gift offered by the TUE, because as of today, these graduates are officially alumni of Eindhoven University of Technology. The TUE wants to give her graduates an alumni gift that says, proud to be from the TUE. 
This gives a clean cut design tube for your NGD diploma inspire, is inspired by the eye catching red slash of the TV logo, as you can see on the table. I would like now to start and first and uh, call forward our first candidate, uh, Mrs. Aretesh, who will be addressed by Mr. Hubbers. Well, Sepede, here we are. Um, I can still remember about a year ago um, in our team, we had an op opening and positioning for, uh, for a bridge developer. And uh, we were interviewing a lot of people back then. And um, on paper, they all had qualifications for the skills they, uh, that we required. And during the interview, however, often it was like, oh, they don't know our product. They are not so enthusiastic about it. So when we interviewed you for our light scripting tool, I was afraid it was the same. But it was actually the opposite. You were so enthusiastic about the project, about Philips Hue, um, that you immediately convinced us. Um, but we had to ask about the technical skills, um, C++ and Qt. Um, and your answer was something like, oh, I will manage, I will learn, and if I need to, I will just will work harder. And um, that set expectations. Um, and interesting was that even before the project started, you already um, met those expectations by asking like a month before, can I already have some documentation so I can get started? Um, we only could give you one simple document, but in the first week we compensated that by overwhelming you with a lot of information. We had a big workshop um, with a lot of stakeholders, a lot of people interested in the project, and a lot of prototypes with some, a lot of code, some have actually compiled. So um, there was quite a lot of work for you to, to digest and learn all the C++ and Qt uh, obscure things. Um, you managed to do that uh, very well, and uh, although you started out with uh, building your code on top of, uh, of, uh, of one of the prototypes, that was that end, you made a very brave decision to start over. Um, and from that moment, I think you took ownership more of the project, both in the direction about scope, but also uh, technically um, how to implement it. Um, that all resulted in a very nice uh, result. We have a nice pro tool that we can build up upon. Very nice uh, document report you wrote. Um, I want to thank you for that. Um, but I also want to thank you for being a nice team member in our team. It was uh, um, very nice that you, for instance, brought a lot of Iranian food on the Wednesdays. Um, and I really hope that we uh, meet again um, in the future. Um, I expect to see a very good engineer, and maybe somebody that um, also has a more leadership role. Who knows if that is what you want. Um, again, I want to congratulate you on your hard work. It has not always been easy with COVID. A young family. Um, thank you. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to invite Mr. Aurora and uh, Mr. Dillon to address the next candidate. Mr. Aurora, dear Akash, 
I'm happy to speak to you today. May I invite you and also the audience on a small virtual journey. We all know what it means if you get ill and how this can turn life upside down and be disruptive. And now imagine a world in which people can keep on doing the things that matter to them, even if they are ill or even if they need care. So grandparents spending time with their grandchildren, a pregnant couple, being at home, even if there are problems, children being able to go to school and play with their friends, even if they're ill. So they only go to the, to the hospital when there's a real need for it, and for the rest they can lead a normal life. This quality of life promise is possible by remote patient monitoring. So where we monitor patients remotely, they're breathing, their heart, many things are already possible today. And also for doctors, this will be a relief. Um, it will reduce costs and it will even improve the treatments, we believe. So why this story? Because you, Akash, you can be very, very proud to be part of this fulfilling vision, I think. You worked in this domain with us, with Philips Research, and I'm very happy about that. You have created a, a very easy to use and beautiful user interface to a product which is called the Remote Patient Monitoring Kit, a long word, um, but it's essentially used to collect data of patients uh, so that we have all the data to develop new products and to test them. And this product is actually a very important building block and you made a big contribution to that. A, little, a few words about yourself. In the development team, we noted that you are a kind of a silent force, eh, as I call it. So you typically work silently, diligently. Um, you are also a little bit soft-spoken in general. But sometimes I, I asked you, uh, is everything going well? And you said, yeah, 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 no problem. And your motto was actually, uh, don't you worry, uh, it's all handled, right? <laughs> so, uh, and that gave me a peace of mind. No problem there. Uh, and you delivered, without exception, really great work products. So the, the software implementation, the documentation, everything was great. Thank you. Uh, so still, I would uh, advise you, or I hope, that uh, in your career you step up a little bit more on the stage, in the spotlight. Uh, you have every right to speak up, yeah. and you deserve it, actually. So, dear Akash, I want to thank you for your dedication, your motivation, your drive for quality, from our side, from the whole team, but uh, also from the side of all the patients that in the end will benefit from your work. Thank you, Thank you very much. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Bayalan and Mr. Seng for addressing Ms. Bayalan. <laughs> so let me first uh, give a little bit of background about the project. Uh, everybody knows ASML by far. Um, ASML makes lithography machines, which is quite expensive, but we also make metrology machines, which is less expensive, but also very important. Uh, for uh, doing the metrology, we have been always using a simple mathematics and a kind of polynomial curve to uh, 
calculate the overlay, overlay is kind of KPI. Uh, people have been always telling me that uh, if you can do it in a simple uh, formula, then you can definitely do that with uh, uh, machine learning and uh, even better. Uh, so this is where the idea came from. Um, but the problem is that I'm not an expert in this field. Uh, I couldn't do it myself, but I can see the potential in this application. Um, all we need was uh, really someone who knows it well and can help us uh, realize it or make it feasible. And we were really, really happy that we find Nasta as the candidate. Uh, of course, to make sure that she has enough uh, support, we arranged uh, uh, lots of domain expert and uh, lots of uh, machine learning expert to help her. Uh, they are all very happy with uh, her and uh, they, are, they enjoyed working with her uh, to, uh, to, to begin with. And during the whole project, Nasta worked really uh, diligently and also very creatively uh, on the project. Uh, she communicated very well with the ASML internal uh, stakeholders. So in the end, the result is quite amazing. So she made a, a prototype to prove the feasibility of using machine learning uh, based approach to do uh, focus uh, extraction, focus metrology. Uh, the accuracy is way better than the conventional method and also uh, find a very innovative way to improve uh, machine to machine matching. So that was really a promising uh, result so far. Uh, we are all very impressed. In fact, uh, we already submitted uh, two uh, invention disclosure form to uh, hopefully uh, apply for patents. Uh, so if all goes well, she would have got uh, two patents before she started working for ASML. <laughs> so I'm uh, also very happy for her that uh, uh, she find a fitting position within ASML. I feel very proud of myself that I convinced her to ditch the other company and join ASML. <laughs> And uh, it is even better, it's on the topic of machine learning. So I hope you uh, have a lot of fun working at ASML and uh, uh, looking forward to work with you in the future. So let me present this uh, well-deserved uh, diploma to you. There you go. Then I would like to ask uh, Mr. Passman uh, to address Mr. Shirascu. And I need to make a special note because uh, Dan get, got, or get his diploma cum laude. Dear Dan, uh, on behalf of uh, myself, but also all of the colleagues at TomTom, uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, for choosing TomTom. Uh, uh, -tom. um, as you give a little bit of background of, of, you know, of why we had this assignment, uh, because it's, it's, it, well, it's not so common for TomTom -tom to be um, one of the industry partners in this PDNG program. But TomTom um, you know, -tom is widely known for its consumer electronic devices. You know, it's sort of become a, a word in itself. Uh, what is less well known is that, uh, in fact, the, re the, most, the majority of our business today is about providing uh, you know, technology into all kinds of uh, systems for automotive domain, but also for other companies. So, so TomTom is actually very much a software company, uh, but we grew up as a consumer software company. And the products that we made always were about providing uh, guidance and information and data to human beings. And thereby there is this sort of, there is this hidden assumption that you know, whatever we do, there is some kind of logic here uh, and in the brain that can rectify anything that goes wrong uh, with our products and with our software. Um, however, you will also know of the you know that it doesn't actually always work out that way, right? We there are people that drive into lakes, there are trucks that drive under uh, bridges that are too low. Um, but what it's um, 
Um, but we definitely see that, you know, as TomTom, you know, where we have the vision to be a, you know, to be a provider or a supplier in a, in a world that has safe and sustainable mobility, that we need to go beyond, you know, what the human can do. So if you look at our sort of our vision, then, you know, we would like to think of TomTom as providing a superhuman awareness of the vehicles uh, that are out there and, uh, and moving around. However, if we pull on those sort of big clothes and try to do that, then we also, as TomTom, uh, take on board a higher uh, responsibility uh, also to society. And we need to learn about that. Uh, and this is where Dan came in, uh, because what we challenged Dan with is said, hey, can you help us to, you know, to guide us in a world where our uh, software is part of a systems, system that is proven to be uh, safer uh, than it is today? So how can we prevent that malfunctions of the system lead to risky situations? And that is something that you want to avoid in, in automotive, because the, you, know, you can all imagine that the kinetic energy of a truck driving at 100 kilometers per hour is, or even 80 kilometers, is pretty big. Um, however, it, it also meant uh, that because it was relatively new to us, uh, we asked you also to sort of to plow your own field uh, ahead of you. And you did that with a, a great drive and, and rigor. You found yourself you know, through the organization, finding the experts, putting, you know, pulling together uh, the dots. Uh, you, know, you, you pulled together also the theory and the, the, you know, the practical uh, uh, sides uh, of it. And I thought that was quite impressive. Um, we also got to know Dan uh, a little bit better, and he's a very modest guy, and I really appreciate uh, that about him. But, uh, but I know that he has a brain that goes really, 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 really fast, you know, even faster than he, than he can speak, and that is <laughs> already quite, quite fast. <laughs> Uh, we also loved your understated humor. Um, that is something that, we, that I think we really, uh, really enjoyed. Um, I think you also learned that, uh, that designing is not only about the, the technical part, but it's just as much about you know, the human uh, interaction and the organizational aspects. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, that, that whatever you do in the future will be uh, a big success. Your work uh, for us is going to be the basis, right, of, uh, you know, of our steps into uh, functional safety. Uh, and I think you can be proud that you were part of that, uh, that early uh, phase. Uh, you left behind an excellent thesis, uh, and you also defended that with uh, great flair. So I congratulate you on your diploma with honors, and I wish you all the best in your bright future. Next, I would like to invite Mrs. Conquette and uh, Mr. Van Pinkston. Dear Janice, as Professor Van der Brandt this morning and this afternoon has said, an OT creates a bridge between the university and the industry in several ways. You got first interested in our model-driven way of working at Canon Production Printing when uh, Eugen Schindler and Christina Moneva presented their workshop on model-driven development uh, using MPS in the OT program. And after this course, you took the liberty to contact them immediately and say, I would like to do something more with this, and I would like to explore this further. Um, and this eventually led to you actually starting to your final project at Canon Production Printing modeling the ink handling part of a printer engine, which are quite big print engines, uh, complex machines. Because we had the vision, we have the vision that we want to create digital twins out of these systems. And this was a significant step forward 
to model, to create domain-specific languages, which is your passion, and a step forward to making such a digital twin. Of course, this to some extent started with choosing one of the many interesting definitions of what a digital twin is. We had many interesting discussions with Professor van Brandt about this as well. Um, in, in, on the other hand, from our perspective, we had to get used to pronouncing your name correctly. <laughs> so that's, uh, uh, but today I've looked at the list and there are many interesting names in the list of graduates today. So uh, I'm quite happy with your name as well. Uh, as with any ND project, NGD project, the complexity of these projects and ambition that we, we put in the project description is limitless. limitless. And it's part of the, the, yeah, the responsibility of the NGD to make sure that the project scope is, is manageable and you, de you dealt with that uh, really well. Um, so now we can capture the essence of the ink handling to make that step towards the digital twin. You therefore contributed significantly to the uh, model-driven way of working and engineering at, uh, at Canon Production Printing, and you show um, uh, that you know how to retrieve your, retrieve your information from your stakeholders and manage to actually put that into a prototype and really get a positive amount of energy into those stakeholders and the people around you and your project. That's something that we really appreciated in your attitude. Um, it is also really impressive to see how you created that bridge between industry and, uh, and uh, the, the university. Um, looking back to the last 10 months, uh, you, uh, you have shown that uh, whatever you promise, you will deliver. And uh, even despite some significant ups and downs during these last 10 months, um, both professionally and personally. It's admirable how composed you stayed during these days, uh, and it's quite uh, yeah, turbulent times, both in, uh, fortunately both in ups and downs. Um, we are therefore happy to, uh, to also say that Shanice, uh, once all the paperwork is signed, uh, ongoing thing, uh, that you will be joining Canon Production Printing uh, as, and start your uh, industrial career. Um, so without further ado, congratulations, future colleague. I would like to ask Mr. Van Klink to address Mr. De Gott. Hello. So, when I uh, first met Christian early this year, uh, I actually did not think I would end up being his supervisor. Uh, he was still being supervised by someone else in the company, my colleague. Um, uh, Christian was uh, supposed to work uh, in the data team um, for his graduation project. And I was and still am a software engineer uh, in the data team. Um, Christian, as I understood it, would uh, work on all aspects of this project, from requirements, engineering, to design, architecture, uh, analyzing security and risks and costs. And I would focus mostly on uh, implementing this system uh, with uh, other people. Um, yeah, so immediately when the project started, there were a few setbacks. Uh, our most uh, experienced engineer uh, left the company uh, to work on a startup that he co-founded. And soon after, we learned that also his uh, then supervisor would uh, also leave the company. So. Yeah, someone had to take over the job of uh, Christian supervision, and I was asked to do this. Uh, and initially I was quite shocked, because I thought, okay, this seems like a big responsibility for someone uh, in my position, especially since I had uh, only started working for Signify the year before. But I agreed to do it, and fortunately for me, uh, Christian is very autonomous and uh, organized, and he's also an excellent communicator. So, within no time, he was uh, organizing meetings with key stakeholders for the project. And uh, together with the help of the team, he figured out what to do in advance to keep the project on track. Um, 
and this was uh, good for me because uh, yeah, I've really felt that uh, I could continue focusing on implementation and leave the thinking to Christian. Uh, however, I should not sell myself short. Uh, there was still like plenty of room for discussion. So if anybody came up with uh, ideas for the design or problems, we would uh, organize a meeting and sit down together to think of an appropriate solution to the problem. And I've always really enjoyed those discussions with Christian. Um, Christian also worked with us on the software implementation of the project. So we got the opportunity to teach him some valuable lessons about software engineering and cloud infrastructure. So I hope we did not let him down uh, on that front. Um, and I would also like to give credit to Christian's initial supervisor for uh, onboarding him in the company and in our team. I uh, was not involved in that, unfortunately, but I think he made the right choice. And uh, yeah, according to him, uh, uh, he always admired like uh, your eagerness to um, try new things and to take responsibility and also um, yeah, just explore opportunities. Um, in the last few months, the data, the data team at Signify has grown a lot. Uh, we have hired more people and we've taken on more responsibilities, uh, also related to the project that uh, we started with Christian. So I think I can safely say that this project was a success. And on behalf of our entire team, I can say that uh, we're sad to see you go and we wish you all the best in your future endeavors. Thank you. Next, I would like to call forward Mrs. Niyambu, who will be addressed by Mr. Ismail. So, Dima. So, I will also begin by giving a bit of context of Lima's assignment. Uh, what was it and what was the importance for, of it for Philips? So Philips, as of today, is a health technology company. So it's going through a transformation. It wants to transform the healthcare through digitalization and machine learning, so artificial intelligence, as is generally known. And we believe that with this digitalization and AI, you can actually enable um, an efficient healthcare, which is much needed today. So our healthcare system is far from optimal, and you can improve patient experience, uh, as well as you can even uh, deliver consistent outcomes from clinical outcomes. So uh, the capabilities of AI and machine learning system is improving every day. So it's more and more becoming more and more capable, but it also means that it has um, also inherent complexity. So the complexity is also growing. And then a natural question is that if we can reduce this complexity by automating some of the tasks in the workflow. Uh, there, is a, there is a domain within this um, automation which is called neural architecture search, which is focused on automating the topology of the networks. And that was the problem that we posed to Lima for her PDM thesis. Can we automatically derive performant topologies for neural networks or artificial intelligence. Um, so the main goal of the doctoral thesis was to analyze this, uh, the state of the art uh, research in this domain, uh, evaluate some of the uh, really complicated schemes, and then apply it to one of the Philips use case, which was uh, fetal head detection through the uh, X-rays. Um, so I'm glad that she executed this assignment really professionally and delivered very high quality results. So we are very glad with that and I want to really thank you for that. Um, we will be definitely using this work to develop our neuroarchitecture search 
Philips' own search process and mature it into a product. Um, Nadia couldn't be here today, but she also wrote uh, and wanted to deliver her uh, you know, congratulations and thanks for your contribution. Um, yeah, and she wrote something that, uh, although you, you had during this assignment one of your most important day, your wedding, uh, but that didn't compromise any of the deliverables, so she was really amazed at it. So thanks again for your hard work. I forgot the slash. <laughs> Now we'll give you. Next, I would like to ask Mr. Putra to come forward, who will be addressed by Mr. Algran. Congratulations with uh, your graduation. I'd like to tell a little bit about the project context and the work he's been doing and about Raspa himself as well. He's done his project in uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific in a division that's creating electron microscopes and where the uh, technology of the microscope itself is impressive. More and more of the functions of the microscope are embedded in software these days. And in order to enable this uh, software to be deployed fluently on the microscope, as well as in the ecosystem around it, uh, RASPA has worked in a group of uh, digital workflow to uh, facilitate delivering software as a service on modern IT infrastructures. And uh, one of our key assets is having a, uh, a cloud-based infrastructure that can be deployed as infrastructure as code in on-premise deployments. Now, one of the challenges we have is the actual interface to this infrastructure as code is quite uh, IT savvy, uh, person oriented. And some of our customers, like in Semiconductor, are in a very closed environment. Our service engineers are great in working with the microscopes and tuning them for great performance, but not necessarily IT uh, experts. What RASPA has worked on is create a foolproof, easy to use graphical user interface application so that our service engineers can actually work with the IT as well as that they're doing with the microscope. And um, he's been very successful in doing that. A few keywords that describe Raspa. He is modest. Um, and although that is a good trait, I, I can tell based on experience, there is no need to be modest in your abilities. You've done very well in this project and uh, yes, you can stand up and uh, uh, present. Um, one other aspect, balanced. Now, throughout this project, RASPA has been very balanced in the various aspects, time and scope management, requirements analysis, the actual implementation, making a nice report, great presentations. So overall, he's been a very say, balanced engineer and uh, in, in that sense, yeah. Um, was very good. Um, lastly, friendly. During your presentation of the final project in our company, the room was full with colleagues. And uh, you made a lot of friends along the way, both because they appreciate what you've done, but also because they appreciate you as a person. Mm -hmm. And so do I. Um, I'm glad to receive you as a new colleague in, uh, in our team, and uh, looking forward to uh, years of collaboration. Congratulations. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Peters to address Mr. Rawal, uh, who receives his diploma with distinction. Dear Shubham, I'm happy to stand here and congratulate you. Um, a little bit of background 
for the audience, you've told your story this morning, um, and you mentioned um, the dichotomy between standards in the world that we work in, in uh, medical systems, where we create images, but we want to extract the data as structured. So, uh, looking back in 1983, I had the chance to see the development of the first prototype MR system in Harvard, but that system could not exchange data. In 1993, I was uh, working for Philips in the MR department, and we introduced the first implementation of the DICOM standard, the one you mentioned. Later, we introduced uh, the, the, the DICOM standard for, for graphics, how to do a measurement on an image. But closing the chasm between the pixels and the, um, and the informatics world so that you can actually do clinical reasoning with the, with the measurements and draw conclusions of that, that is a gap that has been there all the time. Um, and actually, Shubham has uh, been working on a project that helps close that gap and build a bridge. Um, another thing, of course, is that um, it was mentioned this morning in the introduction that the NGD program is a bridge between academia, uh, uh, abstract thinking, and practical implementations. And that's also what I've seen many students here uh, do, and also Shubham has, uh, has created a prototype. What prototype has he created? Prototype for a, um, a software package that takes the assets out of an existing Philips product, because it's nice to introduce new technologies and new standards, but you also have to make sure that the old knowledge of the installed base systems get, gets ported into the new uh, standard environment of the new generation. So, and he's been building a prototype for that. Um, and it wasn't always easy, because that system is actually from a company that we bought a couple of years ago, and it's located remotely, and those people have higher other priorities. So. Uh, the, the access to that system is sometimes hard, and it was not always available. Um, the domain also is very complex, uh, uh, because it's not only about having a structure in your data, it is also about having semantically coded information out of that data. And um, Shuba managed to, to integrate components that were er earlier developed that actually harvest uh, all the knowledge of medical ontologies, and there are like over 100. Um, so, he did a fantastic uh, piece of work um, and uh, managed that complexity, um, doing that re reverse engineering. But he was also asked to do uh, some additional small piece of work, like looking at the clinical model of an MR knee investigation. Again, MR, and that should be simple, but it wasn't simple. It took quite a, 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 some more time. Um, but uh, was also covered uh, successfully. And uh, while doing that, we, we together learned a lot, so I, I, I loved having these discussions with, uh, with Shubham, about what such a model looks like and how you, you can normalize such a model and how you can uh, reverse engineer the coding of uh, what you see there in, 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 the, in that knee, in the, those pictures. And we actually decided that it would be good to write down what we learned in a policy. And Shubham was also uh, writing that policy uh, down and uh, also delivering that policy to a few audiences uh, within Philips uh, research and Philips standardization. So um, you came in as a very soft-toned, a bit shyish person, and you developed confidence in, uh, in your work and in your results and how you present it. And you have pre presented it to many stakeholders, and at the very end, last week, um, you, uh, you presented it to uh, the business uh, R&D team, and they were really, really enthusiastic uh, about the work. And uh, so I would like to end with saying um, it was a great experience uh, working with you, uh, and uh, I would have loved to continue working with you, but the circumstances don't allow that at the moment. But uh, let me stop by uh, handing you over the diploma and congratulate.
Then I would like to invite Mrs. Rachan, who will be addressed by Mr. Van der Vossen. Lamisha, everyone. At ASML, we have a very complex product with an enormous and complex code base uh, running that product. Improving and maintaining the modularity of this large code base is a massive challenge that continuously requires new and ongoing insights into the code base and the tooling to create those insights. We were very happy to get Lamisha to help us um, uh, in this challenge. Uh, a challenge not just in engineering skills, but also on the research aspect on how to actually get those insights into the code base. Lamisha, despite having to start the project under COVID uh, lockdown conditions, as well as us at ASML, not exactly knowing what the tooling needed to do, uh, you were able to pick up the challenge quickly uh, and actively by diving into the existing literature that addresses these kinds of problems and proposing means and methods to get some of the insights that we were looking for. After deciding together on an approach, uh, how to calculate and visualize various metrics, you set to work on creating a tool to realize them. You have produced a good looking tool that provides us with valuable insights into our code base and how to improve its modularity. While lack of time prevented us from deploying the tooling and having the software architect community actively using it, um, I am sure that the metrics you identified and implemented, as well as your suggestions to be able to gain more insights, uh, will be used at ASML in the future to make our products better. In the meantime, Lemisha has successfully applied for a job at ASML. Lamisha, I look forward to working with you in our department. I am sure you will help us bring our software to future products that enable our customers to make future and better computers and uh, computer chips. Uh, Lamisha, many congratulations on a job well done and a very well-deserved diploma. I would like to ask Mr. Sarvani, Saravani to come forward. Uh, Mr. Sarvani will be addressed by Mr. Mariotta via a video message. And I also need to explicitly mention that you got it with your diploma with distinction and I will hand it over, but there will be a video message. Good morning to everybody. And uh, first of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you through this video, because unfortunately I had uh, personal commitments which I could not reach schedule in order to be there in person. I'm Giovanni Mariotta, software system architect for life science applications in terms of Fisher Scientific. And I'm glad to be here as company supervisor for uh, FASO in the last nine months uh, of project together. 
uh, how to make steps toward vision of electron microscope as service, and we connect applications. I want to mention the important part of how Fazol has given uh, a great contribution with his work, and he has been a great example of how our four I values, which are integrity, involvement, intensity, and innovation, uh, has been applied uh, to the daily work with his uh, dedication and passion. Uh, his background and his attitude to delivering uh, working prototypes that provide rich ground to start uh, working connected and distribute applications. This moved the technical vision uh, into materialization with concrete steps, uh, which are very first steps in this case. Uh, he has faced challenges that have put him in the condition to raise the bar and find solution or alternatives to the problem that he has found, encountered and faced. Uh, it, drove in the, it drove the realization of a prototype to enable uh, end customer to use an electron microscope as a service, monitoring a workflow from outside the lab, and creating solution and proposal for faster development. Uh, we, in terms of Fisher, enjoyed having Fazul as a team member for his attitude, commitment, and contribution, bring, bringing uh, good vibes and mood to the rest of the team, and we hope to have him officially on board in future opportunities. Really, really thank you again, Fazo, for your hard work. And I will ask to all of you to join me in an applause for Fazo. And uh, just to mention, congratulations. Congratulations, well done. Then I would like to call forward Mr. Wang, who will be addressed by Mr. Trompert. Hey, Leon. <laughs> definitely not, uh, you're not the last person, but definitely not the least, for sure. Um, as you know, in this 10 month journey, we have worked on a very important mission, because at Philips it's our ambition to improve the lives of 2.5 billion people a year by 2030. And we need to perform that in order to deliver for those at all ages, regardless of their income. And it's also why I was pretty happy to see that some of our colleagues at research are working on these important innovations, but we need to make sure we do it within the planetary boundaries of our planet. And that's where the environment also plays an important role, that we can deliver on this ambition, but to ensure that we limit our impact on the environment. And this is exactly where you helped out, where we um, tried to gain insights in understanding what kind of impact we have in our transportation and distributions of our products and solutions around the world. Digitalization will help definitely with that, with transporting less, so thank you for that. But also to make sure that the organization gets insight, because today, um, too often, our colleagues are still making decisions based on a gut feeling, and in our view, they will be either luck uh, lucky or wrong, and we try to eliminate that element uh, from the table. And we can do that by providing clear insights around our sustainability performance and also the ambitions that we have as a company. And there, data can play a vital role. And that is why it's so important that we have the good data, the right timing of the data, the right cleanup of the data, the right processes, the right team, obviously. <laughs> and the right smart cookies around our, uh, our, around our table to make sure that we can deliver on such a program. And actually, as we speak, we are developing a, a huge deployment of your product, which is the logistics freight dashboard that will be integrated within Philips, to make sure that the entire Philips community can understand where our impact when it comes to distribution is coming from, so that we can make meaningful decisions to really deliver on our climate ambitions. And that is where you have developed a huge role and uh, played a huge role, actually, to make sure that we can reach our very, very ambitious climate targets, that we will ensure that we limit our environmental footprint in line with that 1.5 degrees Celsius that you hear so often, that we really deliver and really start decarbonizing in our logistics performance. And without you, we would have definitely not made that huge step. So over the ten, past 10 months, and I think the team will definitely back me up on that, that you have done an amazing work, the product is there, the auditor is now aligning it and reviewing your work. So far, so good, so fingers crossed that that stays that way. 
But without you, we would not have had these insights. And I think your product will really help us to decarbonize and really go towards a more sustainable future. So, Leon, on behalf of the entire team and the rest that is still at the office, I would like to thank you for your amazing contributions, the great passion, with uh, the passion you had for food, <laughs> for Taiwan, your culture, board games. <laughs> I really appreciated that, so thank you so much. And on behalf of the whole team, I would like to congratulate you on your diploma. And I think we will grab some beers later. So this was the title of the thesis, which was not shown, unfortunately. So, dear graduates, first of all, congratulations with your graduation. From now on, you may use the degree engineering doctorate, or NGD. The scientific degree of NGD involves duties as well as rights. As a holder of this degree, you are committed to the standards of scientific integrity, trustworthiness, intellectual honesty, openness, independence, and societal responsibility. These standards are described in more detail in the Netherlands Code of Conduct for Research Integrity and in the Eindhoven Code based on it. You also have duties towards society. You must be clear about the boundaries of your own expertise, and you must communicate honestly and independently about the results of your work, including potential risks associated with it. You are committed to the ethical codes for research and design involve human subjects or animals. These are serious words, and we address all, candid, all uh, graduates with these words, and uh, yeah, I, I really think that it is important to consider this in your future careers. We wish you all the best and a promising career in industry. High-tech companies are in great need of technological designers with the skills you have acquired over the last two years. Hence, the opportunities that lay ahead will be endless. To conclude this ceremony, there are a few directions for the closure of this ceremony. First of all, the speakers, graduates, and scientific supervisors will leave the Blauer Saal at the auditorium site to have their picture taken as a group. Once graduate speakers and supervisors have left the Blauer Saal, you may exit also to the Voorhof, that site, where drinks will be served. The speakers, supervisors will have the opportunity to, to congratulate the graduates at the reception. And this concludes this meeting. <laughs>